here. We have a good group in the audience today. So we are going to open the um, April 9th regular uh, uh, board meeting for the Board of Supervisors, and it is 9.01. And we're going to have Supervisor Gonzalez lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, can I get a um, acknowledgement of certificate of posting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that's 5-0. So now we're going to move on to presentation uh, and recognitions. We're going to start actually with CAO Espinoza and I accepting um, the National County Government Month. Um, and we are going to have a representative from Speaker Rebus's, uh come up and Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, Board of Supervisors, State Community. Um, good morning. My name is Andres Rodriguez. I'm here representing the Office of Assembly Speaker Robert Rivas, and also here joining me today, we have... Good morning. My name is Maris Hernandez with the Office of Senator Ana Caballero. And we appreciate just taking a brief moment uh, to recognize uh, the County of San Benito, not just the elected officials, but all uh, employees, administrators that really uh, work day in and day out to help out uh, with the community. Um, for From a state office perspective, uh, we understand and appreciate how important collaboration is to really get work done. Uh, if, if, if it's not something that we can do, we always reach out to the county. This is uh, the county that I personally represent for the office of um, the speaker. So we appreciate really the collaboration to connect the dots and really um, get some uh, work done here for our constituents. Um, and like I mentioned, this recognition isn't only for our elected officials, but our um, administrators and employees. Uh, so we appreciate you and we continue uh, collaborating with you. Yeah, and so thank you to all um, the administrators, um, all the employees, because Without your support, I know our Board of Supervisors would not be able to do all the hard work that they do, but also keeping our community informed. I know sometimes you guys have to wear multiple um, hats um, to ensure that our county is successful. So thank you for, for all you do. So um, on behalf of the 29th Assembly District and the 14th Senate District of California, we join you in celebrating and recognizing all county employees, administrators, and electeds for your active roles and responsibilities in serving our residents. Uh, your hard work and dedication as leaders for the community of San Benito County is truly commendable. So thank you so much. Okay, um, so we're also, uh, thank you so much, you guys, for coming and, and presenting today. That was wonderful. Um, I just want to say how much I appreciate all the county employees and the board members. Um, I know from being a former county employee, it's a tough job serving the public um, and, and trying to always keep that smile. I just really know that um, everybody's heart is really in doing the right thing for our community. And from the outside, you may not 
notice it as much, but there's a lot of hardworking people in this county and this community that really care about our future. So um, I'm going to present this uh, proclamation to CAO Espinoza, and um, uh, I'm just gonna read a couple of the highlights. Uh, the, nation, the nation's 3,069 counties serve more than 330 million Americans providing essential services to create healthy, safe, vib and vibrant communities. Counties fully um, fulfill a vast range of responsibilities and deliver services that touch nearly every aspect of our residents' lives. Um, the roles include responsibilities to inspire county residents to engage the, with their community. And I'm just going to go off script here a little and say engagement is one of my goals this year, is outreach, education, and engagement. So um, if you're interested in any um, programs that are happening in the county, feel free to reach out to me because we really we want to have more um, town halls and, and inform the public more about all the services and challenges that we have in our community. Um, I'm gonna end it with that the Board of Supervisors and uh, the County of San Benito do hereby proclaim April 2024 as National County Government Month and encourage all county officials, employees, schools, and residents to uh, participate in the county government celebration activities and also remembering it's our 150th anniversary this year. So I'm gonna turn this over to CAO Espinoza. I'm not used to the photo lady. I know. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna leave this. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'll just uh, okay. wanna say a few words. First of all, incredible staff that we have at the county, incredible. They work so hard and do such a great job. I wanted to just share a few uh, moments with the board and the public, some fun facts about our county, particularly. Um, in the elections office, just in 2024, they uh, uh, tallied 13,134 ballots, um, representing about 36% of total registration. They have done a great job. They won NACO awards for the election drop box um, ride along program, as well as youth engagement and elections. So fantastic job to the elections office. The clerk of the board, they have actually I've uh, been working with the Go Green, Going Green within our community, within our county. They've actually saved more than 43,000 pages of paper being printed, which is pretty amazing. Great job to them. As well as over this last year, they've um, clerked about 110 agendas for the Board of Supervisors and committees, which is a tremendous amount of work uh, with that. Um, there have been over 5,961 visits to the peak agenda on our website, which is great. Our planning department um, has done a great job as well. Uh, the planning applications submitted for this year has been nine, uh, and the planning commission approving uh, six, and the building permits um, as well uh, that were final this year in, 2000, in January of 2024 has been nine, and then February four. Um, for some of you might be interested in this, the, from the sheriff's office, there have been 14,331 calls um, for service over this last year. It's a tremendous amount of calls. They've been able to hire eight new employees, thanks to the board, um, for adding additional staff. Um, our roads off, our roads department, this is a good one. 20,386 staff hours went into addressing the roads. Potholes, addressing the roads, work road repair. So. Kudos to, to um, the RMA staff, the um, public work staff, who've done a great job. It's difficult with the rains, and it, you know, just keep doing it. It's like cleaning that bridge over and over again. <laughs> Golden Gate Bridge, right? Just keep going. Um, the auditor's office has issued over $185 million um, in 15,041 uh, accounts payable um, to um, county vendors. And, um, this is good news for us, the assessor's office. Um, this is where we generate most of our revenue. Uh, they've completed an assessment exceeding $12.7 billion, which is pretty good for our county. Um, and there's so many more things that I can highlight, but I just wanted to thank everybody, um, thank um, you know all the hard work that goes into um, providing services to the community. So thank you.
Okay, we do. Thank you. Um, can I get a motion to approve that pro proclamation? And I'm sorry I didn't do that. In so, so moved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, 5 0. Thank you, um, Supervisor Sotelo. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to uh, the proclamation and uh, declaring April 7th through the 14th National Library Week. Um, can I get a motion to approve this proclamation? So moved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. So 5 0. Okay, and Supervisor Gonzalez is going to come up and present. And so if we could have um, the I, I'm assuming it's going to be the Friends of the Library and Library Representatives. So I'm going to have Supervisor Gonzalez go through and, and list. But please come up cause, uh, as she calls your name. I know if, you're, if you are here. I see there's a large number of library staff, so thank you for being here. Um, so we're recognizing the Friends of the Library, the Friends of the Summit County Free Library because they have provided assistance and support throughout the year. Um, activities and Friends of the Library involved are with, they provided many hours assistance with the distribution of the Chromebooks. Um, they helped in providing giveaway books and community events and parades, helped with providing ideas and material for the homework club, provided treats for movie nights and other special events, helped staff pass out information at the county fair and bought treats for staff throughout the year. So I would like to recognize the, the, the Friends of the Library. So Tammy Acevedo's president, would you come on up? Elaine, Ellen Campos, Vice President. Are you here? Laura Moore, Secretary. Susan Lug, Past President and Board Member. Nancy um, Gerton, is that your pronounce? Okay, Board Member. And Ruth Erickson, Board Member. So as I said, this is the proclamation to recognize um, the week of April 7th through April 13th as National Library Week. Uh, congratulations, whereas libraries are accessible and inclusive places to foster a sense of connection and build a community, whereas libraries connect people with information technology, access to broadband computers, and training that are critical accessing for accessing education and employment opportunities. And there's a lot of other whereas, 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 but I will leave that to you. <laughs> President, Tammy. Tammy, there you go. All right. And on the same item, we have. We'd like to recognize. Let me get this one first. Um, Friends of the Library as being the Volunteer of the Year for the Seminole County. So congratulations, y'all, from the board. And then there's one more recognition. We want to bring up Reno Shear. And what this gentleman did, don't leave, please, for being recognized by the Wimpy Kid Associates Incorporated as winning a $750 donation to the to the Samuel County Free Library. Thank you, Reno. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations and thank you to all of the volunteers from the Friends of the Library. We do appreciate all the work you do. And thank you, Supervisor Gonzalez, for that presentation. Um, we're going to move on to our final proclamation. Um, can I get a motion to approve the proclamation declaring Fremont Peak Day, April 28, 2024? So moved. Second. I'll, I'll give the second to Supervisor Kosmicki. First is Gonzalez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 5 0. And Supervisor uh, Kosmicki is going to do the presentation for us. Oh, 
yes, please reach, please come up. Thank you. try to be brief but I uh, just want to say um, you know we're here to celebrate Fremont Peak in the San Juan Batista Valley area um, there's there's a lot to celebrate with Fremont Peak it's one of those treasures that we have in our community that I know um, this board and prior boards um, have, have really wanted to do more to promote these attractions that we have here and the folks here do a really um, fantastic job of doing that and helping the county and helping our community do that so we're here to celebrate the history of Fremont Peak with Fremont Peak Day and I'll just read a few pieces of this proclamation get a little history in and uh, I'll let the uh, folks here uh, take the mic so whereas today in San Benito County we stand to remember that the Gavilan Peak of the old California days is now known as Fremont Peak rising high over the county divide between Monterey and San Benito counties and we recall that it was John Charles Fremont who led five United States topographical surveys from 1842 to 1854 to find pathways and mountain passes that would lead from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean year-round and whereas today in San Benito County we can step back in time and place in place to the fourth Sunday of April 1846 when Captain John Charles Fremont and his troop set up camp on Gavilan Peak erected a sapling pole and raised their American flag in open defiance of General Castro's order to leave the area and whereas on this April 28th we stand as we stood with volunteer firemen, service club members, veterans of our wars, county civic leaders, native daughters of the Golden West, boys and girls of our scouts troops, state park rangers, and other citizens of this glorious state of California as they celebrate Fremont Peak Day. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that we, the San Benito County Board of Supervisors, proclaim 8, April 28, 2024 as Fremont Peak Day in San Benito County. So thank you very much, and I'll hand over the mic to these folks here. I'll start. I'll make it short and sweet. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Diane Elves, and I'm the president of the Native Daughters of the Golden West, San Juan Batista, 179. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with who we are, uh, it's a women's fraternal organization that does uh, restoration and maintain maintenance of uh, historical landmarks, etc. Uh, we support uh, uh, what do you call them? Oh, the boats coming in. Lighthouses. Uh, we do children's aid for children and stuff. Um, and Val is in, the, in with me, and so is uh, Mr. Botella here. Um, we always go to Fremont Peak with the VFW, and we do a barbecue and thing together. Although the road to Fremont Peak is pretty frightening, so um, they do it at the VFW Hall now. Um, and so we try to keep this going. And We've had members over the years who have hi hiked all the way to the top of Fremont Peak. Not I, but there are others. So um, on behalf of the Native Daughters of the Golden West, thank you. Uh, I don't think there's anything else to say. Um, the Native Daughters and the VFW uh, and the Service Club have done this for 125 years. So it is a congratulatory thing. Thank you. I'm Anthony Botello, and, uh, and it's true, I belong to the Native Daughters, and um, <laughs> <laughs> it's good politics, Colin. <laughs> but, uh, but I also belong to Service Club, and Fremont's Peak Day is a real special day uh, in, in, in our history. Uh, Fremont, uh, Captain Fremont leading that expedition uh, really opened the doors for, you know, California to become a state. And 
you know, we have so much history uh, in our county, uh, San Juan Batista being known as the city of history, and this is a, a big part of it. And it's kind of surprising to me that you, you talk to other citizens in our community, and uh, a lot of them have never been to Fremont's Peak. And the views this time of year is extraordinary. I, I would like to encourage uh, everyone that may take a visit, run up to Fremont's Peak. It's a very important state park in our system. And not only do you have amazing views of San Diego County, but you have amazing views of Monterey County and Santa, Santa Cruz County as well. It, it, it truly is worthwhile taking that treacherous trip on the cold roads. But uh, <laughs> um, I, I, it's a special day and want to thank the board and the Supervisor Kosmicki for bringing this forward uh, it, 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 with this proclamation. Good, good job. Thank you. I just want to add that that frightening road is going to be repaved thanks to this <laughs> county six, six plus billion dollar investment coming up here in the next year or so. So thank you. If the board members could stand up here. That's okay. That's okay. No worries. We'll just take that down for now. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, department head announcements. Uh, CAO Espinoza, any department heads? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we do have some announcements today. I'd like to invite up Monica Bonds. Uh, she is the recycling coordinator, and she's going to provide an integrated waste uh, management update. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Monica Ponce. Um, as uh, Ray Espinosa said, I am the Recycling Coordinator with Integrated Waste Management. I am here this morning to invite you all to our annual Earth Day celebration. This year we will be hosting our event at San Juan Bautista at the State Historic Park near the Mission on Saturday, April 20th, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. This event is for community members of all ages with over 20 booths hosting zero waste activities, a verma composting workshop, a performance from local hula group, Ha'a Hula, e-vehicle test driving, and more. Additionally, we will be announcing the 15 winners of the 2024 Recology Art Poster Contest. This is always one of our favorite events of the year, and we hope that you're able to stop by to enjoy the fun. Um, and I've also brought a couple flyers, so in case you guys uh, want to help us spread the word, that would be very much appreciated. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to invite up our PIO. She has a, a brief announcement. Rosemary Dare. Thank you, board and community. We have a really fun 150th anniversary coloring book that we will be distributing. It'll be a digital version, so you can find this on our website um, under the 150th tab once it's live. But there's a lot of really fun stuff in here, including opportunities to color your favorite elected officials, as well as uh, designing your own county seal, whether you adopt your own county or you do another one for San Benito County, that's an option too. Um, you can also write a letter of appreciation to your favorite department. And um, there's also a short quiz and a crossword puzzle to help everybody figure out what department they should call for what services. So um, that's some fun stuff that you guys can all look forward to in the near future all in recognition and celebration of our 150th anniversary. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. I'd like to invite up Chris, Chris Mangana. She's the Emergency <laughs> Services Manager. She has a brief announcement. Good morning, board. We will be hosting um, a community emergency response team training program starting n um, next weekend, April 20th. It'll run the 20th and 21st, and the following weekend, the 27th and 28th. It's an eight-module program 
um, training, including fire safety, light search and rescue, um, disaster medical operations, things you should have at home to be prepared, and then to help your community. So it is both weekends. You must attend both to be part of the team. Um, I have flyers. I'll leave them in the back, and we hope um, to get a few more people signed up. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. All right. I'd like to invite up um, Robert uh, Gomez. He is our new um, IT manager. We're privileged to have him on board. He comes from uh, the private sector, Barracuda Networks. He has years of uh, experience with that and managing uh, employees uh, there. So we're privileged to have him. I wanted to introduce um, Robert to your board and um, just maybe say a few words, Robert. Thank you. Good morning, board. Thank you, Ray. Uh, excited to be here, work with each one of, one of you uh, to uh, build up the IT infrastructure, get everything going the way we need to get it going. Uh, so thank you for having me this morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Welcome aboard, really. Welcome aboard. You. Welcome to the team. Yeah. All right, and we have, uh, I'd like to um, invite Steve Loop up. He has a few items to discuss. We're gonna provide a quick update with roads and request your board um, uh, request something of your board, basically add an agenda item. So. All right. Good morning, Madam Chair, Board of Supervisors, um, members of the public, Steve Loop, Public Works Administrator. So, yes, I'll um, do a few quick roadway announcements and then talk about one specific project where we recently, as of last week, received some funding from the state. So, um, down in South County, the new Idria Road um, essentially from the Panoch School, why, if you're familiar with that area, down basically near Griswold, Griswold Hills, a campsite, we're going to start reconstructing that roadway next week. Um, we've been waiting for warm weather, and we think it's here, so hopefully um, mid next week, I'm guessing, we're going to start that reconstruction, and that's about eight to nine miles of new roadway. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, in addition to that, in first or second week of May, we're also gonna start repairing the washout. There's a large washout um, of a creek and uh, FEMA actually, and the state granted us about $400,000 to repair the washout. So we'll be starting that um, ideally May 6th. So that's good news. Um, after we are finished with the new Idria roadway project, which should take about six weeks, then we're going to start on Fairview Road from McCloskey to about 100, 150 feet south of Santa Ana Creek um, to start rebuilding the surface of Fairview Road. That's kind of phase one of four that we're going to be working on over the next year, which is very exciting. Um, and then um, Shore Road, we have the plans ready. We're going to send them out to bid in May, and so hopefully we can start building Shore Road from Fraser Lake to Perry Court um, as phase one. And then phase two would be Perry Court to San Felipe Road. And we're doing it in two phases because it's two different funding sources. So um, that'll be starting this summer as well. As soon as we receive the plans to <laughs> Um, for Coal Road, we've been waiting for a while. There were some issues with the recent storms and some embankment failures, and so we've had to sort of revise those plans on Coal Road, but as soon as we receive those, we'll be bidding those out. Um, been waiting patiently for those. And then the last project I want to mention, it actually um, was programmed to start this year. It's actually being accelerated a little bit because last Wednesday, when we were posting the board agenda, we received word from the state that they were going to give the county $204,010 um, if we can bid the project and award it by May 17th. It's, we've been waiting for about six months to receive official confirmation and we received it. And so as CAO just mentioned, um, we're going to be, I'm going to be handing out some plans and specs because we actually received the info after the board agenda was posted and so we've created plans and well we've had plans and specs um, 
and we've finalized them, I guess you'd say, uh, for you, and I'm, I'll be handing those out. So I'm also gonna be handing out the board agenda. So I think the chair just reads through it and I'll kind of walk you through that. But basically, I'm gonna be handing out plans and specs so that we can utilize the $200,000 that the state's given us because we have to award the bid in about six weeks, which is a pretty accelerated timeline. So we have to get that going essentially today is the reason why the, the, it's an urgent item, as they say. So, so um, we need So we need to do a motion. You, you need to, yeah, we need to do a motion if your board's okay with putting it on. Let's to add an item. Add an item. That's great. I just had a quick question. If I miss it, what road? Sealy Avenue. I'm sorry. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a motion to add this item? It would be item number five or 2.5. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 5 0. Okay, so we'll add that on as 2.5. Wonderful. So, um, and I think that's something. Yeah, that's okay. great. Thank we'll, you so much. We'll hand out yeah. everything out. Um, it, yeah. Can I ask a question? Go right ahead. Steve, really quickly. Um, oh, yeah, I had a couple of questions too. So. so, I think you mentioned, so, it's, you know, six week timeline for this new Idrea Road um, kind of reconstruction, then the next is going to be Fairview from McCloskey to north of Santa Ana Creek. Did I hear that correctly? Actually, just south. So we're actually going to go um, about 100, 150 feet south of Santa Ana Creek, kind of near the RV park. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's the one. Um, so I was just curious um, will we be doing any type of notification to the public? I know it's such a, you know, it's a heavily used road and uh, will impact. Uh, lots of traffic of people getting out of town on their way to work, on their way home, to school. Just I think it, if we can get ahead of that and get the information out, I think it'll be, it's just such a heavily populated road that people use. So any, infor and, and same thing with Shore Road as we begin to do anything, I think just um, any information that we can get out to the public is gonna be really helpful and hopefully um, people can plan accordingly. So. Great point, and you reminded me actually of another project that we're hopefully gonna be we're actually creating a special web page because of the location, but um, the Union Road Bridge project is proceeding on schedule and budget. And um, so we're gonna be doing the tie-ins to Union over, we're doing a new, a new brand new signal at Cienega and Union. And we're also doing a tie-in on the east side of the project. So we're actually creating a special web page for that area because it's also pretty congested and that's part of the project scope is, um, so we'll also be doing that. But yes, we'll work with the PIO on shore and Fairview as well to get that out to the public. Yes. Supervisor Kosmicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wondering if, if there's an update on any progress we might be able to get to have um, the, the road project status, the timeline, sort of like that map, even if it's a map or, you know, typed out either way, maybe typed out is easier for staff, but um, have that online so that we can refer residents to those because that's the most often questions that I'll get is just, you know, what's what's the timeline on this road, X, Y, and Z? And it would just be helpful to have that as soon as you can, just to have that for the public. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, you mentioned it a few weeks back, so it's ready, but I, I do have to get it loaded on our website, so I'll Great. do that yeah, right away. No pressure, just, just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. And then Car Avenue, is there an update on the speed? I've been getting questions on the speeds, the bump potential. This, I know we were gonna be doing a study for potential speed bumps on car. Yeah, so the study's finished. It's a two-phase process. It's finished. We've actually been working, we've been going back and forth with the City of Hollister to get an agreement with them, an MOU, because they can actually install the speed bumps and the striping for about half the price, it seems like, as contractors. So I think we're on the, the third iteration to get an MOU with them. I was hoping to get on this agenda, but it'll have to go hopefully on the April 30th agenda. So once we have that MOU, then we can have that those speed bumps installed. Um, so, okay. So we are going to get speed bumps for sure, though. For sure. Car. Yep. Yep. Great. And then um, San Juan Highway timeline. I know that's just the big one out of all of them for me in, the, in my district. Yeah, I'll talk to the consultants. They're doing a few different projects for us. That's one of them. I will ask them, and I will send you an email update on San Juan Highway timeline. Appreciate that. Thank you, Steve. You bet. Supervisor Zanger. Hey Steve, um, just a question: <clears throat> Is there, a, I guess, I'm just on Lone Tree Road. The residents have started making a new road on the side of the road to avoid the potholes. So I was wondering if there was an update on any plans for addressing that. Uh, I think you know what section on Lone Tree there where they're making new trails there. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to talk to our road crew yet. I did. We are aware of it, I guess you'd say. So um, 
but I have to talk to the road crew to see what the plan is. We'll, we'll need to get up there. I was up there last week, and so I kind of saw the, the situation, but um, soon, I guess, is we'll try to get some help up there. Are you good? Any supervisor can tell us? I had a question on Flora Road. Uh, what are we doing with that? I know we started working on it with the city in conjunction with the city. Um, will those holes be um, filled anytime soon? So we, we did, you're correct. We gave some material to the city. They installed it. I think there needs to be more material. So the issue, just for folks that aren't aware, there was a dedication of Floor Avenue where the several decades ago the, the county dedicated half of Flora Avenue to the city and there's some discrepancy whether the city ever accepted the dedication so um, we've been working with the city we've been giving them the material they've been installing the product to kind of work together coordinate with them um, but I think we need to give them more material so they can install it as part of that coordination effort so I'll work on it that week because there's they only maybe got 30% done in my humble opinion there's still more to do Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna chime in here because you brought up Union Road um, and the bridge. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, it's, it's wonderful sitting on that bridge as long as I sit on that bridge. I'm not complaining at all because I want the intersection redone. But um, the complaint that I am going to say is when you turn right uh, from Cienega onto the Union Road Bridge, so you're on the Cienega side, not on the downtown side okay. on San Benito Street, um, they put the uh, flag person ahead sign so that you can't see any oncoming traffic. So, you, so if you're turning left, you can't actually see the oncoming traffic. And I've actually had a couple people call me on it, but it also, when I, when I drive my Jeep, I'm fine, but when I drive a car, I can't see anything. So it's, it's more of a car issue, not a truck issue. Um, and then the other thing is, is just, um, uh, I'm happy to hear about the website. You know, you're gonna do something on the website about uh, the construction timelines, because uh, there is becoming quite a backlog now um, in the mornings with them. Maybe just some outreach about plan extra time if you're traveling over Union Bridge right now. Um, and then the other thing is, on Cienega Road, that future stop sign has been a future stop sign for a really long time. Yes, and and people fly through that thing, and so if that could actually happen in the future, that would be great. Yes, and um, I already talked to our a resident about that. So our sign person's they're in hazmat training this week, but we'll get it in next week. I did want to wait till was the rainy season was past because it kind of gets slippery and people do dry really fast there. So, um, but we will get it in hopefully next week. So. Yeah. Okay, sounds good, and it will have like a. Stop, stop ahead. ahead. Uh -huh. We're gonna put a yeah, stop ahead that'll sense. be great because th that blind curve right there, they just come flying by. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And so that's it. Is there any other comments? Nope. Okay, so Steve, anything else or are you good? I'm good. And do we have any other department heads? Thank you, Madam Chair. No, we don't. Nope, we don't. Okay, so we're gonna move on to board announcements. Who would like to go first? I'm gonna pick. Supervisor Kosmicki, how about Always you? first, that's fine. I, I should just raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, um, yeah, not much. Just want to say, um, hope everybody had a nice Easter. If you celebrate Easter and had a nice time to um, spend with your family and everything. And then um, yesterday we had our fire protection committee uh, meeting, uh, Supervisor Kerr and myself with the city of Hollister and city of San Juan. And we're just moving ahead again on, um, there was some delays on uh, this grant award to um, to fund the necessary work that we have to do the study work to potentially start a fire protection district with the cities and the county and we're just moving ahead with that thank you thank you supervisor gonzalez nope okay supervisor zanger nope and supervisor satello okay. thank you a um, couple of things uh, we had our economic advisory committee meeting supervisor Kuro and I um, sit on that committee we had a presentation from a new nonprofit in our community visit San Benito they're a new nonprofit focused on hospitality and tourism so really exciting um, we are still reviewing the bylaws um, and we'll hopefully bring those to this board uh, within you know, hopefully soon 
Um, our next meeting is Wednesday, April 17th. I want to invite everybody there. It's at noon at the Epicenter. Um, and we're going to be getting a presentation from MBEP regarding kind of uplift and what's happening. They've received, I, I believe, $14 million kind of trying to figure out where to use it. And so um, we, we definitely want to be a part of the conversation and what can we bring and do for San Benito County. Um, we, Supervisor Zenger and I, had the Vets Park Commission meeting. Um, a lot of excitement happening there. Um, the bathrooms on the south end of the park, I believe it is. Am I right? Yes, yeah, south. Um, which is closest to the large softball fields and the heat fields are being redone. Those hoping to start construction with probably the next two to three weeks. Um, as well as a repaving, restriping, and a lighting project that will go over that entire um, parking lot and um, I think it'll make it a lot more um, safe we're looking at adding in a or we will be adding in a new entrance and exit to that park um, again really the focus is safety out there that should um, that project should happen later this summer um, and we the other thing that we're working on is a procedure and rules for food vendors that want to be out there um, and so we are, um, Commander Spandry with the VFW and I have been tasked with meeting with all of the leagues that utilize that park out there and the city of Hollister um, regarding kind of the plans that are, that are upcoming regarding the bathrooms and the parking lot, but also their involvement with this committee. Um, I think we really want to have a lot of collaboration and cooperation and um, we, we wanna know kind of what the, what are some of the things that they're seeing, what their needs are, and how we can kind of work together. Um, Supervisor Kuro and I went to a CSOC, CSAC course um, on the 1991 and 2011 realignment. It was amazing. We learned all about kind of the history of it um, and how to better utilize these funds. Every county is a little bit different. We're all a little bit unique. And so how do we, um, how do we, you know, use these funds and utilize them so that we're really um, capturing everything that we need to be doing within the realignment, which really kind of focuses on behavioral health, health and human services. Um, but also um, in the 2011, it really dealt with public safety. And so I have a much better understanding. I think I'm a much better supervisor after coming from that class and really understanding things a lot better. Um, lastly, we had our juvenile justice committee meeting last night. Um, and I just wanna give an update really quickly because um, the Youth Services Center, which was previously the juvenile hall, um, was closed temporarily um, for kind of an upgrade and kind of a, a redo of some of the different things out there. Um, they re and, and so during that time, our youth were sent to Monterey County if we had any youth in custody. Um, they reopened in, on February 16th. All of our youth are back um, in our county. Um, we are still awaiting a few things, um, furniture and different things. Um, but I just want to say thank you to Monterey County for you know allowing our youth, but also thank you to the staff. They really are incredible out at that Youth Services Center and probation and um, the Juvenile Justice Commission, the volunteers that sit on there are just amazing. They're so hardworking, they take their job incredibly serious and they're so focused on the youth and um, really trying to give as much opportunity. So um, just really grateful to be a part of that committee and I just wanted to clear that up. There had been some misinformation I think in the community that we had closed our youth services center and that is absolutely not accurate. It was closed temporarily, it is back open and our youth are in San Benito County. So that is it, thank you very much. Okay, um, uh, thank you for your updates because I'm on committees with both of you. I'm not gonna do any updates because you did great updates on the fire and on the CSAC training uh, and EAC. Um, I did attend um, the Cesar Chavez uh, luncheon. Um, it was a, it was last Saturday, and it was a great uh, uh, tribute to our farm workers. And um, it was great to see Speaker Revis was able to attend. Zoe Lofgren was able to attend. Con excuse me, uh, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, and um, others. And it it had a very good turnout. It was just very inspiring to to be able to attend that. Um, 
and represent the county. Um, I have nothing else to announce, so we're going to move on to public comment for items that are not on the agenda. If you'd like to make a comment in chambers, please provide a speaker card. And on Zoom, please press star nine or the raised hand icon. And in chambers, we'll start with Tammy Avalos. Good morning, Madam Chair, Board. My name is Tammy Aviles, and I'm here with the Friends of the San Benito County Free Library. And I just wanted to um, say thank you. Thank you to the library staff um, for the Friends as a group being selected as volunteer for the year. Um, over the past year, we've actually gotten to know the staff better because we've worked in the trenches with them. Um, but I also wanted to let everybody know um, that our monthly book sale is this Saturday, April the 13th, from 9 to 11.30. And um, you can fill a bag with books for $10 or $5 on the first bag if you are a member of the Friends. Now I want to switch hats. Um, I am on the board of Seniors Council and I know that the director, Clay Kemp, um, sent to each of you this letter regarding AB 1249 and <coughs> the consequences if this bill passes to our county. Um, the AAA, which is the Area Agency on Aging, um, which covers San Benito and Santa Cruz counties, through Seniors Council advocates and manages the federal, state, county, and city funding for health and meal services for the seniors in our county. And um, I'm sure you've probably seen this, um, that seniors are the fastest growing age group in California. And in San Benito County, we are the third um, fastest growing um, county. SB 1249, um, I guess part of it, as I understand it, um, may actually dismantle the existing AAA and kind of bump it down to the counties. So the counties would take over the, um, or serving as, would serve as a nonprofit providing these services to our seniors, which I'm sure the county doesn't want to take on more work. Um, so, um, so Seniors Council, they are working um, on this. I mean, I kind of, I'll defer to the advisory council representatives from the county to maybe go into more detail about it. Um, and then lastly, Seniors Council is holding a solution summit on May the 30th at the Community Foundation Epicenter and more details will follow soon. Thank you. Next in chambers, Ruth Erickson. Good morning, board. Ruth Erickson. I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a tickle in my throat. About 20 or 30 years ago, when CMAP was first being discussed, they had four channels on um, Charter. And meetings, all the meetings from San Benito County, a lot of them from Gilroy, and a lot of things were happening on channels 17, 18, 19, and 20. When uh, it was taken over, we lost all the programming. So we have four channels doing absolutely nothing. And unless you are working on a computer, you never see any of the meetings, any of the things happening. We used to have um, not just meetings from the county and the cities, but we would have the local football games, the parades, a lot of things going on. A lot of local people used to watch all of that and we don't have that anymore. Are we gonna get some time in the future our four channels back 
so that we can watch the City Council, the Board of Supervisors, the San Juan Batista meetings, the school board meetings, all the things that we used to get because we miss them. And we don't want to always look on a computer. Not everybody has that to be able to watch this. We've lost a lot of people who used to be participating in the meetings. They don't come anymore because they don't know they're there. Uh, whether it's the, um, the library or the, the airport, the com committees, all the committees and commissions used to be on there, nothing. So sometime, I don't know who's in charge of this, but I know there's a lot of people who ask me, why aren't, why aren't the meetings on there anymore? And I said, I don't know. We have four dead channels. So if somebody can look into that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next in chambers, Elia Salinas. Good, ma good morning, Madam Chair and Supervisors. I'd like to start off with, um, I appreciate um, the uh, efforts for recruiting employees for San Benito County, we have a shortage and we need to get out more. But I really want to emphasize background checks before jobs are offered. It's very important. Just even a Google search finds things. I am sure that um, the county, if they don't, they should invest and um, a software company that does those checks for you um, so that you don't offer somebody a job and then find out that you should have done a little bit of research. Um, the landfill is not a done deal. Um, there is that uh, cell class one that is the responsibility of the city of Hollister. It's my understanding from attending planning commission meetings that they wanted um, waste connections to clean it up as soon as possible. Uh, waste connections are not responsible for it, so I would like to see an agenda item where you all discuss uh, how you're going to approach the city of Hollister to start cleaning up that hazardous waste out there. Uh, so uh, we have maybe 12 years lifespan. It's gonna cost millions of dollars and you need be proactive instead of reactive on what's going to happen on that. Same thing with I asked last time is I re request that an agenda item be brought forth to discuss a transfer station. We're going to, the landfill is going to close. What are we going to do? We need to think about the future. So I think you need to be finding out, doing your research. What is it going to cost to do a, a transfer station? Uh, so we need to find the location, what part of the county it's going to be put in then you're going to have your NIMBY show up and saying they don't want it there so it's going to be time consuming different to find a location that everyone's going to be happy with so I would like to see you all being proactive instead of reactive to start looking for um, a, some kind of a response to the landfill closing and or uh, what are we going to do as a county where's our trash going to go if we don't do a transfer station um, and then regarding um, the NIMBY folks and the pork people, whatever you want to call them, they're out there getting signatures for a new measure, which was a, revise, a revision of Measure Q, which would be economically devastating to San Benito County. So again, uh, the board being proactive instead of reactive, what are we gonna do when these folks come through? If they come through with this, now it's going after commercial. Thank you for your comment. Next in chambers, Valerie Eglin. Well, since I was here, you know, I couldn't resist bringing up a little something about the parks. And we've got some exciting news. Uh, we have been able to hire staff uh, part-time to deal with our organization and uh, that's uh, Navarro uh, 
consulting. So we're very excited, very capable, and we're moving forward with investigating uh, grants. And we have uh, brought one to the attention of uh, RMA, and uh, we're moving forward with that, hopefully. And what it's a two billion dollar allotment from the federal government uh, for this fiscal year 25, and it is due in the fall. Uh, so we have plenty of time to work on that with county uh, uh, grants personnel, uh, and there's also an earmark process. Uh, that we can go to Zolofgren to see by the end of this month the earmarks need to be submitted by our Congress people to uh, get uh, earmarks on parks funding for 25 and if we're putting in the grant and we have uh, uh, what, support from our Congress people and we've already gotten uh, positive verbal from uh, different departments that are willing to give us plenty of letters of support. So it seems to me that we fit all the categories for that funding, and they are from two to twenty million dollars uh, across the United States. So two billion should kind of filter around the country. Uh, so what I'm uh, encouraging is that the Board of Supervisors uh, take seriously the timeline there and the uh, county uh, staffing that will bring it forward for our regional park. So thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. And I have one on Zoom, Rob Bernowski, and you've been unmuted and you have three minutes. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I feel like it's been forever since I've uh, address you. So, um, you know, part of what I do is I advise individuals and companies and, you know, one of the things I have to remind, especially smaller businesses, is for the owners to take care of themselves. And I advise them they always have to take care of, you know, the most important things first. And, you know, for them, that would be, you know, food, meaning groceries, not restaurants, utilities, shelter, in other words, housing and transportation. And uh, you have to start with that as an individual if you're gonna start a business. If you're running a school district, you know, you have to take care of what's most important first. So by way of example, if you know that you're gonna run out of capacity, you take care of the capacity issues first before you add luxuries. And um, I, I bring that up these examples to you because when it comes to government, especially local government, the most important thing is confidence in that government. You want to make, you know, everybody has to feel good because you're spending our money or you're taxing us or you're getting us in debt. And, um, and, and you guys all do a wonderful job right now here today of managing uh, all of those things for us. But confidence arose when, um, you know, there, there's perceived, I, I don't know what the word would be, ugliness in, in the election process. And I guess what I'm asking you folks to do is to always keep in mind, I mean, you know, you're going to certify election and this is not about that. And soon somebody's going to be, you know, there's other people will be sitting up with you. And, you know, there, there's a slight cloud over that. And what I'm asking you to do is in the future, or to take steps now in the future to remove any clouds in the, in the process of which you are sitting there. And I really want to encourage you, this is really what my message is, is I'm asking you folks to engage more with the community. Um, I know you guys are busy as supervisors and to really sit down and think with yourselves, where are we spending our time? Is it really in, you know, doing things that the administration should be handling and all of these meetings and stuff? And maybe reducing that and being out in the community more, even asking people to host meetings where you are in your district talking to people about the concerns, because that's how we got to where we are today, where there's this, you know, there's a cloud, is, is uh, because, you know, 
look, the squeaky wheel gets the, the oil. And, um, you know, uh, people with very good intent cause certain things to happen. And what I'm asking you is to engage more. Thank you for your comments. Any additional? That concludes my public comment. Okay, so we're going to move to consent. Can I open it up for public comment on consent? If you'd like to make a comment in chambers, please provide a speaker card. And on Zoom, please press star nine or the raised hand icon. And in chambers, we do have Elias Salinas. I left my glasses up here. So. Uh, 1.6 and 1.7. Um, so this is the fourth amendment for Kim Lee Horn and Associates. And the issue is Kim Lee Horn was, was a, uh, awarded this contract. How did they get the award? How, did the, was, how was the award granted? Because they were the lowest on the bid they were the most qualified. I mean, what is the standard? Because they got the contract and now they're on their fourth amendment and they just got one in March the 12th and now they're here on April the 9th asking for another increase in their contract. How does this happen? How, how are you as a county, whomever is doing this, taking on and once they get once these companies because this is not the only company it's happening to once these companies get these contracts you're in it and you can deny it and what are they going to do they're going to stop work so you need really need to take seriously what is going on with all these contracts that are being awarded i there's there's another um there's an issue on the public hearing this afternoon because of the same thing what is going on do we need to have an outside uh, independent third party come in and actually review how these contracts are being done? Um, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of tax money going out. Uh, now, then there's a Jack Davenport uh, street sweeping services. Um, was there an RFP, or RFQ done on him, on this company itself? Um, so they're out of Bakersfield. Couldn't you have found somebody local, street sweeping services locally? I, I just, I'm astounded as to why we have a company all the way from Bakersfield. They brought their equipment, or they will be bringing their equipment to here, to Hollister, San Benito County, and um, are, there, are they, are they going to buy one? A buy, a buy a new street sweeper, and, and it'll be here locally? Because they're not. we know they're not going to be going back and forth with it. Um, as of 2010, um, in 2010, the, the state told all these companies you're going to have to go um, electric or hybrid or whatever, and it was an expensive process. But uh, I forgot the numbers here. Um, it's 141 times six for this contract. Um, we could, San Benito could buy its own street sweeper and employ one or two people to operate the street sweeper on a seven days a week because each one, the two people could be overlapping on a four day and a three day and so on that it doesn't even have to be, uh, it could be a person who's doing it on a part-time basis. If you do it, you could be street sweeping out there on a Saturday and Sunday as well. There's, you just got to think out the bo outside the box and stop spending money to contract everything when there are, if you have the resources to spend over a half a million dollars for a company from Bakersfield, you have a half a million dollars to buy a street sweeper and these CSAs c contribute to this, right? And you hire employees to do it. I'm just thinking I'm, I'm tired of coming up here and it's contracts and contracts and that's just not contracts. It's renewing the contracts over and over and over again and it gets expensive and here we are. We don't have the money to hire, you know, new sheriffs, you know, not just a new sheriff. I'm talking about 
replacement. You have, you know, somebody said earlier, you know, we got eight deputies. You may have gotten eight deputies, but you didn't, you replace positions. I would like to see firefighters and police officers new positions because we are already below what it is and you need to hire above what you have right now. So save money, please reconsider this. Think behind closed doors if you can't discuss it out here, but something has to be done with all these contracts. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I have no other public comment. Okay, we're gonna bring it back to the board. Is there any items? Supervisor Gonzalez? At the request of the public comment, I'm gonna pull um, 1.6 and 1.7. Okay. Supervisor Kosmicki? It's 1.8, 1.9. Supervisor Sotelo? Supervisor Zanger? Okay. So we have 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9 have been pulled. Can I get a motion to approve all the remaining consent items? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so that's 5-0. Okay, so we're moving on to regular agenda. And our first item is from our county council's office um, approving the contract for public defender. Yes, um, as you know, the uh, Public Defender Committee uh, met with the state representative who pro provided a presentation to the board recently. Um, as a result of those conversations, um, the, my office um, contacted um, local uh, defense attorneys to see what was available here. Um, the, the state, as you know, is recommending in-house um, the creation of an in-house <coughs> public defender would be, it, it would require um, extensive uh, expenditures of funds, um, even to find a location for them within a county building, um, several employees with the, all the benefits of those public employees. Um, and um, so what's presented to you today is a contract which would give you a three-person public defender office first here um, with offices here in, Pres in uh, Hollister um, and all local attorneys um, and all local staff. Um, and um, I think Ekam can talk to the contract. Uh, there was a, um, I noticed uh, there was a rumor that the contract was for two years with a six year extension. It's not, it's two years with a two year possible extension at the discretion of the board. Um, so you will not be obligating yourself beyond the two years. And in fact, there's an out clause any, any way you can terminate the contact with a certain amount of notice, but I'll let that speak to that. Right, thank you, David. Good morning, supervisors, staff, members of the public. Um, I don't have much to add here, except, um, yeah, this contract amount is just shy of a million dollars uh, annually, and this is for two years. We did get 500,000 per year from the CCP, so that's gonna um, ease on the financial climate here a bit. And then another thing I wanted to add, uh, just to give the board a heads up, is we, we will be bringing on the next agenda uh, an item to add 200000 as a separate investigator fund. And so that's the, one of the reasons we were able to bring the contract amount down from what was proposed, uh, is because we're going to be having the investigators pulled separately and managed separately through a different contracting system. That's going to have a more uh, consolidated approach, and it's going to streamline the way that our defense attorneys use investigators by having one central resource is having, instead of having it split up between each level of defense. And we will be also replacing the tier two because obviously, you know, damn car is moving up to tier one. So we're gonna need a tier two replacement. That's also gonna be on the next agenda. Uh, and I'm here to answer any questions. Well, let's open it up to public comment. If you'd like to make a comment in chambers, please provide a speaker card and on Zoom, please press star nine or the raised hand icon. And in chambers, I have Elias Salinas. Thank you. This takes care of tier one. What happened to two and three? Okay. Those people also need representation and need representation that's going to be above board, especially what's going on right now, what they're getting. Um, it was my understanding when I spoke to Mr. Dam Carr, he had an investigator that the salary included investigator. This is the first time that I hear 
an additional two hundred thousand dollars. So, I now that puts it over, uh, I think now almost one point two for this, and we don't need to start over again. Santa Cruz just went through this. We discussed this the last time. Santa Cruz just went through this and started their own. Their own. So go to Watsonville. Go talk to Watsonville and find out what they did. And if you follow what they did, you find out what mistakes they did, what worked, what didn't work. And not only that, so it can be expedited. It's going to cost money. But in the long run, it's going to cost money for a benefit that's required that right now the citizens of this county are literally having their constitutional rights violated. They're not getting the appropriate legal advice. They're not being seen. They're, they're, in the, they're at the courthouse. I just had a conversation with someone last week. They're in the courthouse, and the attorney went in there and spoke to the other attorney, the, the, the public defender and the uh, attorney's, attorney, <laughs> district attorney, assistant district attorney. And they go in there and they talk a couple of seconds. The, the public defender goes in there, the attorney goes in there and says, I need a, I need a uh, continuance. I have another case that's more important. I need to get a continuance. That was the sixth time that that public defender had gone in there to get a continuance. And this individual is just being dragged on and dragged on and the person wants to get it over with. That is what's happening. And it's happening not just with public defenders. It is happening, those public defenders are also getting hired privately. And their public defenders are on the list for public defenders and they also get hired for doing the job as a regular attorney and not a public defender, and those individuals are still giving the same type of service. They're getting hired by a lay person who knows absolutely nothing, and they're depending on one person to help them out, and their life is dependent upon that, and they're getting very, very poor service. So the state has already told us what to do. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. And let's get going on this sooner than later. And please, you need to come back on what's going to happen with Tier 2 and Tier 3. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Also in Chambers, Israel Via. Uh, good morning, buenos dias. Israel Salazar Via, voting and tax bank <coughs> constituent. I'm also the deputy director for the California Alliance for Youth and Community Justice, which is the nation's largest alliance in the nation focused on youth justice. As I mentioned before, I'm a school to prison pipeline survivor who, has, who was pushed out of elementary school and what we continue to refer to as the juvenile justice system, which is far from just and in fact remains a very racist punishment system, which this county has directly siphoned our young people for generations due to an overinvestment in policing and punishment and a lack of public defender's office with little to no investment in indigent defense. I remind you of the day you were officially recognized and onboarded to this county board, that being a commitment to our United States Constitution, which in fact includes our Sixth Amendment right to effective counsel, which this state public defender's report clearly outlined this county's extreme failures. I urge you to undergo a participatory budget process with the AB 109 funding stream to ensure equitable allocations to further actualize and establish our own public defender's office. This county has failed our marginalized and impoverished community members for generations, and I urge you to consider the amount of civil litigation that may ensue due to ineffective counsel, which this county is responsible for. Where overall budgeting is concerned, I urge you to invest in intervention and prevention versus punishment and incarceration. I would also like to know how I can apply to serve on the ad hoc committee created to help this process. I'm also wondering if there are any open seats on our juvenile ju county juvenile justice commission. If so, I would like to volunteer my time, expertise, and serve on this committee. Lastly, I challenge you to have the moral courage to do what is right by your community and constituents, uphold your moral obligation to our constitution as our county board of supervisors. I know there are at least three of you on this board, but I honestly believe all five of you will reach a unanimous decision to do what is right. I uh, challenge you once again to make a formal and clear motion to establish our own public defender's office with a clear timeline and accountability matrix. There should be absolutely no excuses, delays, or kicking of the can. Your budgets and, and decisions reflect your values, and I encourage you to do what's right. 
I know we have a two year timeline and I think we could figure it out together within one year and have a specific timeline for that two year mark versus any extensions and a thank you. Thank you for your comments. Can I just ask, is your contact information, because I wanted to get your contact information last time, is it on? Can you leave that for us? Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, more public comment? No, that concludes public comment. Okay, um, so bringing it back to the board, is there anyone with comments from the ad hoc supervisor, Gonzalez? Yes, um, actually I'm the one that, as um, county council says, started a rumor, and it's not a rumor. If you go to the staff report, it clearly states that this has an option to renew to potentially up to April 30th of um, April 30th of 2030, which in my calculation, that's six years. So if you didn't want it to be potentially extended to, to for six years, then that came directly from the staff report. And so it's not a rumor, it's fact. Um, and so I called ECM as soon as I read this, um, the agenda item on Wednesday last week, and I said, hey, this is not what we spoke about in the ad hoc. We talked about um, hiring Mr. Damkar, and, and I just want to go ahead and for the record, I have no opposition for Mr. Damkar personally nor professionally. I have a problem with this report that's come to us and this item and the potential six-year delay in the county establishing its own public defender's office. And while I respect the concern that there's no space in terms of physical locality of a building, we don't have the staff, there might be an issue with funding and hiring appropriate personnel, we had a unanimous 5-0 vote at the, last, at the last meeting when we discussed this item. And I just feel like it's disingenuous to bring this item in this fashion, in this manner. It's like we're just ignoring what the community members came out. Diane Ortiz from Youth Alliance, Youth Alliance brought a whole um, group of people, of her um, constituents, telling us what we needed to do. We had Ashanti Mitchell from the State Public Defender's Office telling us what we needed to do. And I truly thought as a supervisor we were going in that direction. So this item does not read with what we discussed in accordance to my interpretation. And so I have, I have a significant issue the way it's written and the way it's presented to us. Um, and I know everybody else needs to talk, but I would encourage the county to, to set up this oversight committee um, that Mr. Um, um, Israel Villa just mentioned. And I know that he would like to be on it. And so I would like to make support his inclusion, um, Youth Alliance's inclusion, um, and to make sure we have other members of the community that have had experience with the Public Defender's Office so that we can right the wrong that has been ref uh, referenced to in Mr. Mitchell's report as well as from the comments from the community. Um, but um, I'm not supportive of a two-year contract to be extended for an additional two years. I would go for the two years with the potential extension of a one-year contract with the provision that the county is moving in a positive direction to set up the Public Defender's Office to secure a building, start amassing staff, and make sure that we're online and we include the oversight committee and that we're meeting on a regular basis and we're really hearing the grievances from the community, especially those that are being impacted by the, the injustice that's happening in the court system here in San Mateo County. And um, I'm now 62 and I, I'm personally aware for the last 40 years of what's been going on in this court from family members, friends, relatives, whomever, just people that have called me and said, B, this is just not right. I actually went to law school because of the way justice was doled out in San Benito County. And it's, it's just ingrained in me that we have to do the right thing. Not only do we have a moral obligation, but we have a legal and constitutional obligation to those individuals that need public defender services. And so I'm gonna get off my soapbox, but I can't support this extension of this contract to 2030 at all. I can't. Can I address the 2030 bit? That's an error. That's a clerical error on behalf of staff, and we apologize for the oversight. The actual contract, the text of the contract is correct. That is what would be signed by the chair of the board. That is a two-year contract from 2024 to 2026. And if the county, if the board of supervisors at that point decides that it wants to continue for another two years, that would be until 2028. Or you could authorize staff to amend the contract or um, a one-year extension or whatever your board chooses. Supervisor Sotelo. Thank you for the clarification, Ekam. Um, so I appreciate all the work that went into this contract. Um, 
and I know that there are concerns about um, different kind of services providing, making sure that we're, um, you know, we don't want to be providing the services that we're currently providing. It's not good, it is not adequate. Um, and so I think the whole reason that we're going down this route is trying to provide better services for the community. And I think that in the contract, I think you did a great job in laying out the expectations um, and it addresses a lot of the concerns that we have heard um, kind of made in public comment today. Um, and I think that it also, um, there's a whole section about the reports that are um, due to the county. I actually, um, so just kind of going over some of the expectations, um, there is things inside of this contract that address, you know, um, telephone calls being promptly returned, um, you know, making sure that the, avoiding the failure to report any margin oral or written motions by any defendant, um, avoiding any actions of unprofessionalism and dereliction and dirty duties, sorry. I would suggest that the public really read through the expectations because I was really impressed, Ekam, with how detailed um, you, you kind of worked on this. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Damkar, um, there's quite a few reports that are due to the county, and I appreciate um, some of this. I'm just wondering, I think if, if I read correctly, it's like monthly, you have kind of all of these different reports that are due to the county. Is that, um, is that expectation reasonable? Um, you know, I, I know, you know, we're really trying to make sure that we don't go down the same path that we were, and so there is a lot of oversight in this, but I also don't want to create, you know, I, I want the attention and the focus to be on um, the people that need this service, and I don't want you taking multiple hours to provide a report to us. Um, I, I think some reporting is necessary, but it's pretty extensive, the reporting, so I just wanted your feedback on how you felt about that reporting. I, I'm not opposed to reporting. The first issue, though, I'm going to have to address is we have attempted to get a uh, contract with, um, I don't remember the name of the company right now, <laughs> it's drawing, I'm drawing a blank, uh, the same company that provides services to the DA's office for their database system. I was told that even if we sign that contract today, we will not have that system until January. That's the problem, they're so backlogged. It's a company in Colorado, but it's the same one that the, I think probation department uses and the DA's office, and we kind of wanted to be on the same page. So I'm looking for an interim solution right now. I think there's no reason we can't generate the report. Right now, we have to generate a report each month. It's not quite as detailed, but it has most of the, the items that are requested. How many uh, felonies, how many misdemeanors, how many conservatorships, how many um, other matters, uh, family law matters, et cetera, that we're appointed to. So we'll, we'll be able to do that. It just may be a little more arduous in the first few months because it's going to uh, require a little more detailed database collection system. And that's what I'm working on. There is another provider that I'm looking at, but I don't know whether they're going to require a like a five-year contract, a three-year contract, or whatever that is. And, and of course, that's on me. That The county is not going to be paying for that directly so I'm going to try to find out what we can do but I think we can generate a contract the first few months are going to be a little hard because of the of the uh, transition okay thank you I appreciate that I just wanted to make sure that we weren't setting up you know an expectation no. in in some of the reporting but fantastic no. to hear that you're good with that um, so I know that tier two you'll be representing tier two until the end of April right, then if this passes, goes through, you would effectively take over tier one in May, May 1st. Um, it sounds like a future agenda item, which I'm guessing is coming back to us at the April 20 something meeting, uh, will be addressing tier two, and tier three is Pamela Brown, um, and that contract is continuing. And so um, we will have, um, and we will get that figured out before May. I know that we need to have all three tiers um, filled and so um, I did notice on one of the I think it's a what was it the it was a um, special circumstance how often does a special circumstance happen so this was the one um, so upon the filing of a homicide case when the potential penalty is life in prison 
without the possibility of parole or a death penalty. So you would do one case per year is included in this contract. Anything over that, um, we would be charged and there's the breakdown of costs inside of this contract. I see the dis assistant DA is here. How often do we have these cases? I mean, is this something where it, traditionally in the past we've had uh, historically one or three? I'm just looking because, I mean, it quickly can kind of add up. I need you to come up to the microphone. Sorry to put you on the spot. I just saw you sitting there and I thought I would ask the question. <laughs> um, I've been here nine, my name's Ellen Campos. I'm the assistant district attorney. I've been here nine years. I believe I have not seen um, a special circumstance case in the nine years I've been here. They're, they're rare, okay. they're very rare. Okay. And it's Carpel, by the way, is the um, case management system that we use. And I think, and I wanna mention that they absolutely should have something like that and I endorse that. I know you can ask me. May I ask okay. a question regarding that item? Is it, well, we can share the resources from the DA's office and our probation with the, um, just with the public defender's office, or would it be a conflict because of whatever information you have might be the matter in which is at, at, at issue for the court hearing? Um, it's not something like we can, we can share the resource until he's up and running in January? Well, for him to be able to access, um, he's, he has to have his own contract. We, mm -hmm. Law enforcement, our local law enforcement, I think including probation, have a limited subscription that allows him to see certain things in our database but we have a lot of confidential information in there. Um, we send our electronic discovery to the public defenders from that program and they don't have to have it to receive it, but I believe if they get the, that, um, that system, I think there's a, a, a much easier access, but what the real benefit of it is, and we use it too, is we run reports. Um, it can run all kind of reports of what kind of cases we're prosecuting, how long they take, um, how much um, victim contact we have, all those things we can put that data in there and we use it for that reason. And I believe, I'm assuming, I don't, I'm not familiar with the public defender program, but I assume it's similar to ours. And so I think it would really help him produce those um, reports for you um, much more easily and quickly when he has that program. Okay, it's a, sh it's a shame that we're gonna have that six month delay um, to get it. It took us mm -hmm. a long time to get it too, and there's there's a lot of data that they have to. I, r I was here for that whole process and assisted with it, and there's a lot of data they have to input. So that's part of the reason. Uh, thank yeah. you, Ellen. Uh, yeah. Yes, Carpel is the program, and um, can you speak into the mic, please? Sorry. Sorry. Yes, Carpel is the name of the program, and since I've been here, probably the longest of any attorney in Hollister, uh, as far as criminal cases, um, we have. Historically, we don't get very many special circumstances cases. I have one right now. There is one pending. And uh, in years past, we've had as many as two or three in a year. That was in 1983, I think. And that's the first time that ever happened, I think, here. But uh, uh, no, we don't have very many. Well, thank you. Again, I really um, commend the kind of all of the work that went into this contract because clearly everything has been kind of thought of and, and put into that. Um, in as far as the investigator goes and this two hundred thousand dollars as this future agenda item, um, you know, I think that I think previously in the last contract we were spending I think forty thousand dollars annually on an investigator. Um, so this is going to bump it up to two hundred thousand, which I think will be. Um, Fantastic. I appreciate you being willing to negotiate with us. I know the original contract was 1.5 million. So we're down to under a million dollars. And even with this 200,000 for the investigation, which that position is so incredibly uh, important to the work that you're doing, we're still far below what we started with at 1.5. We're at 1.2 essentially um, total. So I, um, I'm, I'm in favor of this. I agree. I, I don't want to see us drop the ball, and um, we need to be working. I, I would like for us to, um, I don't know if it's possible for us today to maybe designate an ad hoc committee to start the process of what is the application. I, I'd love to be able to put something out to the community for community members to apply to be on this advisory kind of committee that will 
one, do some oversight of kind of, and probably review some of these reports that you'll be submitting monthly, making sure, you know, everything is, is looking good and, and proper representation is being had, but then also starting to plan the process for what does the public defender's office look like moving into the future and how do we deal with kind of the budget and, um, the, you know, a depart a, an in-house department and where do we house these people? And so um, I think we should get started on that sooner than later. And so I would love to see, um, I'm good supporting this contract today, but I also would like to see, and I don't know if it's acceptable for us today to do um, an ad hoc committee to start working on this, but a month turns into six months before we know it. Yeah, with how but busy I, don't, I don't think you mean an ad hoc, I think you mean the oversight committee. Well, but I'm, think, I'm saying an ad hoc to get the process started, mm -hmm. us figuring out the um, application for the community. Um, this, I'm gonna interrupt you there. Um, does this fall within the agenda item to be able to discuss ad hoc since it's not actually agendized that way? No, you'd have to bring it back, okay. but I, I think you're really um, talking about appointing a standing committee. Um, because right, and, but I, I think what, what Supervisor Sotelo is saying is that the ad hoc would take the lead in getting that standing committee okay, started. That, that's fine, but it should come back. Yeah. So, so we need to we bring can that get that back. with that future agenda item with the um, investigation, the investigator money of two hundred thousand dollars, the tier two contract, and then also um, kind of the beginning formations of this committee would be amazing. But I'm good, um, and thank you for all the work that's gone into this. Any other can I just oh. add that do we make sure that we do the um, oversight committee in that discussion so we can go we'll, ahead. we'll add that to the future yes. agenda item uh, supervisor uh, oh. sorry I just <laughs> wanted to address two points I've been meeting with the Fitzgerald law firm on the transition that's been moving smoothly we just have a few things we need to uh, go through yet and that is uh, changing over telephone system and computer system things like that secondly as soon as you select a new uh, second tier, I'm gonna do the same, I will do the same thing with whoever that is. Okay, great. Supervisor Kosmicki. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, so first off, there's nothing disingenuous about this uh, contract or the staff work that's been done. I just wanna put that out there and wanna um, applaud Ekum for the work he's done. He's doing a great job um, for the county. We're all in this together, I think, and we all have the same goal in mind um, as far as the contract goes it's a standard contract um, there are extensions in there but as pointed out um, there are out clauses you can cancel at any time with 120 days notice um, so I just want to point that out and you know make the point that it's essentially a moot point the, the extensions are it could be a 50-year extension it doesn't matter you can con you can cancel the extension so there'd be no reason to oppose this other than just political theater so thank you it's not political th theater. Madam Chair, let me okay. explain. Um, we already know the wheels of justice move really slowly, but the wheels of government move even slower. And when we have an option for a 2030 extension period, nothing's gonna be done until 2030. Let's get real. We already okay. know as a community. Okay, um, so I'm Supervisor so I Gonzalez. Take I take issue I know, with what Supervisor Cosmic The staff said. has actually acknowledged that that's a typographical when, error. When he and I spoke, he did not acknowledge to me that it was a typographical error. This is the first I'm hearing that's a typographical. Um, and so I appreciate you admitting that now, but it was not mentioned to me when we spoke on Wednesday. Because uh, you could have just clearly alleviated a lot of stress for me if you had said that, but you did not. So I'm just confirming from staff that the contract is accurate. It's a two-year extension option by the board that would only go to 2028. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Zanger? Uh, no, I mean, not much left to say. I'm ready to, to move on, ready to vote and move on. Okay, and I'm gonna agree with that. Is there a motion on the table? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, by vote. Um, if you don't mind, can we take a five minute? Is that good? I'm going to break for five minutes, okay? We'll be back at, we'll say, uh, 20 tell.
the dais. I gave you an extra minute, everybody. <laughs> calling out Supervisor uh, Sotelo for being late. Okay, so we're gonna bring the meeting back. We're good? Okay, um, we're gonna go to item 2.2. .2. It's gonna be from Steve Loop from our Public Works Department, and it's a roadway management technologies um, on paving, uh, pavement conditions. Correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, one thing that we've been learning um, during the past year and a half, working con in conjunction with FEMA and the storms, is that um, I'll give you an example. For Salinas Road, we have an embankment failure that ballpark is going to cost $400,000. And the embankment itself FEMA in the state, it looks like they're going to reimburse us for most of that. However, the roadway adjacent to that um, is going to, was affected part of it, and part of it was, doesn't, wasn't impacted directly by the storms. It's still there today so that folks can drive on it. Um, but we want to, when we, when we rebuild the embankments and that shoulder, and even the part of the road that was eroded, for the roadway, one of the things FEMA looks for is, okay, show us that you've maintained your roads and your shoulders properly before we give you reimbursement. And so um, our road crews make notes and they say, you know, we're at Salinas Road today or we're on San Juan Canyon Road today doing X, Y, Z. One of the things we're going to do is get a little more specific probably and give post miles or locations so that we can get some of that reimbursement from FEMA. The other thing we're learning with FEMA is when we have a culvert washout, which we've had a half a dozen or more during the last storms, FEMA wants to know that it didn't wash out the culvert and the road during the storm event because it was a corroded pipe or that the road was already caving in around the pipe and then a little bit of storm washed the pipe out. So they want to see, okay, are we, yeah, are the, um, is the county maintaining their pipes properly? And, or was this just an old corroded pipe that was crumbling anyways? And so one of the things we did just in December, just a few months ago, was we had budget available for you know maintenance and consultants. And so we reached out, I did some research and reached out to Roadway Management Technologies um, to at least to start with providing a maintenance log software, and I'll explain that in a second, of our culverts, maintenance and clean activities, and so that when we go onto a culvert, say on Pinoch Road, um, we'll be able to enter, in our, our folks will be able to enter in on a log. Maybe they'll have laptops, Chair Kuro, we'll see, but um, our, our crew will be able to enter into a log saying we cleaned out the, the, the culvert on Pinoch Road today. And that's really all FEMA wants to see. They just want to see some maintenance recently of a culvert to show that we weren't just abandoning it and letting Mother Nature deteriorate it and et cetera, et cetera. So we started that in December for, for culverts. The other thing that this software does is it, it actually, and we're going to have the, pro the, the software provider present kind of a demonstration in a moment and explain it better than I can. One of the things it does is it gives a real-time monitoring of our pavement conditions. So in the old days, I'll say, or five or 10 years ago, seven years ago, the only way to know your pavement status, the current condition of your pavement was to visually 
drive the long road and make notes and you have sort of a pavement guru make notes of okay you know lone tree road has xyd con xyz conditions and it's rated poor or you know union road was just rebuilt it's rated great and so you had to have someone drive all the roads all 450 miles of the roads in the county and make notes in order to come up with a report and you use that report to come up with your pavement condition index and that tells you the conditions of your road well the, the part of the presentation today is going to show the software where they have essentially road they have cameras mounted on our road vehicles our county vehicles and sensors that as our trucks our county vehicles drive over the roads it actually updates the condition of the road based on a lot of different factors um, that you'll hear about in a moment and so that's going to do two things if you know we move forward with this part of the software one you know in a few years um, funding for measure G might be filtered completely towards highway 25 what that means is today we get about 2.6 million dollars from the state for gas tax we get measure G which has been about four or five million a year and we spent it up to this point um, which has been great measure G has been great thank you you know sales tax people that are you know purchasing things in our county and then we have RSTP funds which are about hundred fifty thousand a year and some other smaller sources and then luckily a board of supervisors actually injected you know about 28 million dollars plus or minus into the road budget so that we're gonna be able to build a lot of projects over the next few years which is great but you know three years down the road we might just be back to the SB1 tax which is 2.6 million what that means is we're gonna need to efficiently allocate that 2.6 million and you might say okay well rebuild all the roads that are falling apart yes understood but for example we just resurfaced a portion of Cienega that we repaved about four or five years ago and just that small resurfacing is going to extend the life of that payment another 10 years so instead of spending you know a few million dollars down the road we just spent two hundred thousand dollars and got ten years out of that two hundred thousand dollars so we might have to prioritize different roads besides just saying rebuild everything which is kind of that's you know where we're at today is just there's a lot of roads that need to be rebuilt but at some point we're gonna say okay does it make sense you know to get your biggest bang for the buck to actually just resurface a road that might be ten years old might start having cracks and things and you can do a crack seal and a little bit of asphalt overlay and then you just bought yourself another 10 years for $200,000 instead of waiting 12 years and spending a few million dollars. So that's kind of the gist of um, this software, this presentation. The other thing we're finding is some grants nowadays um, are actually starting to, for roadway planning purposes, there's a Safe Streets for All planning grant. That grant wants you to do a feasibility study of your roads and this software would actually help with that feasibility to get you a planning grant which would then go into a construction grant so it actually helps um, with some of the could help with some of the current grants that we might be pursuing in the future so I'll let um, Cameron McCollum he's a uh, president of the software company I'll let him kind of take over from here if he's on the yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, Board of Supervisors, for taking the time to, to hear from us today. Um, my name is Ken McCullum. I'm the founder and CEO at Roadway Management Technologies, and, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about exactly what our technology is and, and, and what it does. Um, so, so what we've done here that is, that is really unique I'm going to interrupt is, you for just one second. We're going to make sure that yes. the PowerPoint presentation is showing. So if okay. you could just bear I, with I, us for one moment. There we go. We just had it come up. Okay. Wonderful. And I might have to just tell me next slide, um, Candler, when you're ready. I'll yeah, no, uh, no, no problem. problem. So, um, you know, essentially what we've done here that is, is unique as compared to, uh, you know, traditional methods of, of understanding what pavement condition or pavement qualities are is, is we actually empower the agencies that we service 
to go collect their own data in a passive manner on a daily basis. So what we've done is we've developed a hardware system that we actually mount on all of the fleet vehicles of the agencies that we service. And as those vehicles are going up and down the road, going about their normal daily routine, we're passively collecting all the pavement condition data. And, and what I mean by passively collecting this data is there's no interaction required by the driver of the vehicle. In fact, the driver of the vehicle doesn't even know that the system's on the vehicle outside of a, a small dash camera that is mounted right behind the rear view mirror. And, and what this allows us to do is, is really a couple things. Um, you know, first and foremost, it allows us to log into this platform and see what the current condition of all the roads within our network is on any given day. So, so we can actually see real-time data in terms of pavement conditions throughout the entirety of the network. But what is really more important than that is being able to understand the trends in deterioration or the depreciation of these assets. So by monitoring them on a daily basis, you know, like Steve mentioned before, you know, when we encounter a, a critical weather event and we have damage throughout the network that we need to, to go combat with a, a FEMA claim, we now have quantitative evidence to prove exactly what is happening throughout the network, which is, which is certainly valuable. Um, you know, Steve, we can go ahead and, and jump into the next slide. Um, you know, right now, in, in 2024, I know that, that San Benito is looking at allocating a, a lot of money uh, towards a you know a pretty major rehab program throughout the network. Um, you know what's interesting is that these these roads as assets are really no different than the vehicles that we drive up and down these roads on a daily basis. So you know a, a good analog that I like to use is if you were to go buy a brand new vehicle and you were to drive that vehicle 50,000 or 100,000 miles without ever changing the oil in it that vehicle is going to fail and your engine is going to blow up. But if you properly maintain that vehicle throughout its life cycle, you may be able to get 200 or 300,000 miles out of it. Our roads are no different. So by, by actually switching from a, a worst first approach, which is we're going to go pave a road and, and you know wait 15 or 20 years until that road fails and go back and, and mill an overlay or replace that road, what we can actually do is we can switch to a preventative maintenance treatment method that will allow us to amortize the life of that road by up to 40% longer, which is extremely important in today's environment as we're seeing the prices of asphalt increase. We've seen asphalt prices increase by almost 80% over the last five years. However, you know the available road budgets have, have not increased proportionally. So essentially the result of that is, is we are doing less with the same amount of budget as a result of this material increase. So what RMT is designed to do is actually provide a simple and a seamless transition from a worst first approach to a preservation-based approach so that we can actually monitor um, you know, the deployment of these funds to make sure that we're using all of our taxpayer dollars in the most efficient manner possible. Um, Steve, you wanna jump onto the next slide? So th this is you know, essentially kind of a screenshot of what our dashboard looks like. And we'll skip through this. Um, you know, we actually are already working with the County of San Benito in our work order management platform, like Steve mentioned a moment ago. So we actually have all of these services built into a holistic platform. So you're not having to deal with multiple software providers. This is just simply an expansion within our existing platform. Uh, and Steve, we can jump on to the next one. Um, you know, funding opportunities. Yeah, SS4A is one of the ones. That, uh, that we mentioned a moment ago. And, and what that really is, is, is a feasibility study for the current conditions of, of the road network or throughout the entirety of the network. Um, you know, just as an example, within the state of California last year in 2023, um, over, uh, over $58 million were allocated in SS4A grants and 100% of the applicants that applied for uh, planning and demonstration, which is essentially a, a feasibility study, 100% of those applicants were awarded the funds. Um, those funds can be used uh, to purchase the RMT services as a feasibility study. Uh, and the average allocation per agency was $873,228 per agency. So. Um, you know, the, what we allow these agencies to do is we have a differentiator where now they have quantitative data to support the requests that they are making uh, when, when going after these federal funds. Um, Steve, we want to jump on the next slide. I think, I think at this point I can jump into a demonstration, so if I can share my screen here. Yeah, please uh, try to implement screen share. We think it should work. So. 
Are you all seeing my screen now? Not yet. Well, no, but let me... Here it comes. There, there it is. Go. We see great. it now. Thank you. Okay, okay great. great. So, so this is just a quick example of exactly what our platform would look like in the dashboards that you all would be able to access at, at any given point in time. So this is a cloud-based system. You can access this from any device that has internet access. Um, what we can see here is we can actually see a map or a, a geographical representation of pavement conditions throughout the entirety of the network. Obviously, green being our best roads, red being our worst roads. We can see what percentage of our roads are falling into each of these categories in an A through F scale. And then, you know, this is, this is really the important part here, right? We can see what is our current network PCI, that's a pavement condition index. So think of it as a normal scale of 0 to 100 on pavement health. We can see what our current average is. We can see the remaining surface life. So for each road in this network, how many years can we expect it to last before it's failed? And then finally, we can see the network value. Now, by collecting this data each and every day, this system is updating. So this map is going to update every single night at midnight with the, the data that was collected by all your vehicles as they're just going throughout their normal daily routine. And we're going to see that information reflected here. And, and this is where we can see how is our network performing or how has it been performing over the last 12 months, right? Now, this is, this is extremely important when we're looking at, at planning initiatives and budget allocations, how, how much money do we need to spend? And when we are underfunded, this is what becomes the differentiator when going after those grant funds to be able to say, we, you know, this is what our current network condition is. This is how quickly our, our, our network is deteriorating or depreciating. This is how much money we need, how we plan to allocate it, and if we don't receive these funds, this is where we will be in 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, et cetera. Now, we can also see the current condition of every single road in this network, and this running PCI, this is telling us how quickly each of these roads are deteriorating or depreciating, as well as what the current asset value is. Now, how are we going to help you deploy these funds in a more efficient way? This is where we're using AI and machine learning to actually go in and suggest preventative maintenance projects to these agencies. So as an example, one of these preventative maintenance treatments is a rejuvenating fog seal. So if we were to select rejuvenating fog seal, the system will highlight all of the roads in the network that are a project candidate for rejuvenating fog seal. And then we can actually click on this list format we can see each and every road, what the current PCI is, the length, what the cost of performing this treatment would be, as well as the return on investment. So the way that we are calculating this return on investment is if we spend this $2,253 to perform a rejuvenating fog seal on this road, how much longer is this road going to last as a result of that treatment? So you would be selecting these treatments to create projects. And then we're also monitoring the performance of each and every one of these projects throughout your network, again, on a daily basis. So all of this is happening in the background. Um, you don't have to have a team of engineers that is going out and driving each and every road in your network on a daily basis to try and keep up with current conditions and, and planning and budget allocations. We've got a platform that's essentially, you know, a live view of everything that's happening within your network. We can see here what the return on investment is. And, and you know, instead of having to go talk to neighboring agencies, our system will actually provide you information about successful treatments from neighboring agencies and how they're performing. So it's constantly updating that projected return on investment for each road within your network, as well as the network as a whole. Um, the final thing that I want to point out here is we are a software as a service solution. So you do not pay for any of the hardware. We actually provide all the hardware for free. We come out and we install that hardware on all of your vehicles. And finally, the hardware is warrantied indefinitely. So at, at no point are you at risk of paying for any hardware. There's no gotcha pricing. We're just simply a flat rate annual fee where you're paying for access to the data. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll press pause and open it up for any questions that we may have. Okay, before we do that, we're going to open it up to public comment. If you'd like to make a comment in chambers, please provide a speaker card. And on Zoom, please press star 9 or the raised hand icon. And I have no public comment. Okay, bringing it back to the board. Any questions? 
Yes, I thank you for the information. I actually went ahead and subscribed to the service so I can go ahead and kind of look at it in real time as well. Um, but my question is, there isn't any cost associated with this item on the agenda. So what is it going to cost the county to implement it? Um, so, um, yeah, this is a presentation. And then I guess, um, Candler, I don't know if you've calculated out the, the annual cost for our county. Um, I, I, I do, do have, have the annual cost, cost Steve. So the, the annual cost for the county would be $98,000 per year. Now, just to, to, to give a little bit of context there, you know, the average cost per mile within the county to mill and overlay a road or replace a road is around $500,000. So if we, if we were to look at making that same investment into materials, we can either overlay a quarter mile of road or we can monitor the, the current health uh, of the entirety of the network in real time. Thank you. Supervisor Kosmicki? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair Curl. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, it was a great presentation, Steve. I appreciate staff bringing this forward. This is, this is exactly what we need. Uh, we've got to get more efficient. We have to use technology, uh, uh, do a better job of using technology, and we're doing that. So I really appreciate that. And there's no better place to use technology and be more efficient than with roads, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the numbers, though, obviously, we're, I think we're all aware of 300 out of 451 roads is fairly daunting. And that's why, you know, I personally, and I know the board as a whole, um, does support, you know, moving ahead on roads as a priority. But it's, it's you know, it's, it's a long road ahead no pun intended um, to get back on track to get caught up just to get to a, a decent level of having decent roads in our community um, and this this is one to me I'm gonna support this uh, $98,000 is, is definitely worth it to me um, I know we're just getting us you know a presentation today and we'll give direction but I want this to come back like tomorrow <laughs> uh, let's approve this thing um, and so uh, I think this is one piece of the puzzle, though, uh, for me. I know we're, we're, you know, we're committed to $28 million in the next four or five years or so. We, you know, we have SB1 money, but as you pointed out, and I keep saying, that Measure G money is going to be shifted, and it's around the corner. And that is going to be a huge, huge um, roadblock for us uh, that we need to get over. And that means um, you know, the county needs to support more systemic funding for roads going forward. And I will be doing that, and I am committed to doing that. So I am. I am, uh, I am very confident, at least from my perspective, that we should be doing this, but we also down the road when those Measure G funds are reallocated, we need to be committed to um, putting more funding systemically toward the roads uh, as a county. And whether that means finding more revenue, reprioritizing revenue, we need to do it because it's the number one priority of our residents and we're here to represent those residents. So um, I think this is great. Um, uh, you know, PCI, having that information is key. And um, I also want to say, though, that, you know, um, traffic volume needs to be taken into consideration. It's not just the PCI as far as which roads are prioritized. And I don't know whether that plays into this technology as well. But maybe, for instance, that's more of a subjective slash objective, um, if that's possible, uh, you know, responsibility of the staff and us as supervisors but more so staff because you're the experts really so I just want to make sure that traffic volume is also and I you know I'm not trying to um, t take anything away from South County because we need to fix up South County we're doing that with New Idria I'm just saying it as the bigger picture it needs to be also one part of the equation and I have roads in my district as well that are terrible but they're just not driven that much so they're not they're not going to be number one on the list they might be seven or eight or nine but they're not going to be number one necessarily so i just want to put that out there uh, again great presentation i'm all on board thank you supervisor satello sure. thank you um yeah i i think this is really exciting i think to um kind of bring in some of the ai having the live view is going to be um, kind of amazing. I think it's going to help us leverage more dollars from grants. And um, when we do have kind of catastrophic events, uh, we'll have the data to back up that, nope, these were in good condition or, um, you know, and hopefully make that process from getting the designation from FEMA or getting the, the, the money from FEMA eventually um, maybe easier for us and kind of have that defense. Um, I, I 
I agree with Supervisor Kosmicki. I think that if there's a way to build in the traffic, like how, you know, if there's a way for that to be a part of the consideration is um, the roads that are mostly used, I, I think is, is really important. Um, and so I am really supportive of this. I would love to see this come back um, sooner than later and um, get moving on it. I think it's really exciting. So thank you very much. Supervisor Zanger. Just a question, um, the CAO. When could we hear the same? When could this come back if we support? I will have to work with Steve on uh, budget. We'll have to look, um, look at the numbers, uh, where we potentially could take it from uh, the funding. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think we actually budgeted for it in the RMA office, but we can come back and we'll look at it and give a, you know, uh, give a presentation. On but in like six months or no, no, no. We, we could probably do it. I, I'm, I don't want to guarantee the next meeting because we're already planning for you know submittals and everything. But probably the meeting after cool. it would be realistic. Two meetings from now. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So I do have a couple questions, and and I thank you so much for the presentation. And please don't take my questions uh, offensively. Um, but have we looked at any other software? Um, like, have we done an RFQ and RFP? on this type of thing? Or is this a unique type of software? Um, see, I'll take that one at a time. So I did look into similar softwares. There's only really two out there. We can do, we can absolutely do RFQ, RFP. Um, that's fine, RFQ, and, and I'll talk um, with our team to see if that's the way to go. If there's, if there's three or four folks out there, that's, a g great idea if it's just a couple then sometimes it's it's kind of spinning our wheels a little bit yeah um, i agree because it's um, a pretty unique technology and so i'm just wanting that. I did to make one. sure the purchasing policy is being followed just because that's been a hot topic great point um so and and i know there's in some instances because he's a, they're an existing vendor there's ways around that with just enhancing programs so that may be the way around that i i i I used that when I was a county employee <laughs> to my benefit as much as possible instead of having to bid out. So um, true confessions there. Um, how, how, <laughs> how often, I'm, I'm thinking South County, and thank you Supervisor Cosmicki on the volume thing. South County, how often does the road crew actually drive some of these roads? Well, um, believe it or not, so generally speaking, South County has more embankment failures and a lot of the creeks run right along the roadways in South County as opposed to crossing perpendicular. So long story short, I don't know what the percentage is, but during the storms, I'll say over the last year, we spent a considerable amount of time in South County opening roads for people so they could get to their homes or clearing mudslides off of their roads. Um, generally speaking, you know, we probably focus a little more on North County because of the volume. Right, but I, I don't know the percentage. But the nice thing about this is, you know, it's mounted on all our trucks. This technology, as Candler mentioned, if we all decide to move forward with it, and the supervisors decide to move forward with it, um, and so, you know, even if a truck or two are going down to South County, let's pretend most of the crews in North County, but a truck, a truck's going down to South County, and there's only, you know a dozen roads that folks really travel down there, you know, primary roads. So that single truck could cover a decent amount of roads for the day, whereas the rest of the folks would be in North County. So, um, so, so one yeah. of the things th that it does, does it, I mean, once you've driven all the roads, does it, it, it track how long it's been since you've been on a road? So it, that, that could be a benefit to, you know, so you guys don't have to say, okay, when was the last time yeah. the camera went so over? you know this road just thinking ahead not, answer not that sure. one camera yeah absolutely um so just just a couple of points here yes we we do monitor the last time that we had data on a particular road and we can actually set thresholds to identify when we have a road that has not received data in a particular amount of time um so we can set those notifications up for you i i would also like to point out to everybody that we do have a traffic module so we have a partnership with an organization called NRICS that has nationwide traffic count data for all of the roads in the nation. They do that by extrapolating from cellular provider data uh, where all the cell phones are traveling in the country. 
Um, so we can also turn that module on for you as well. Um, and, and finally, you know, we can install the system across a variety of different departments. So it would not be unique to just the road department. Um, we can also install on sheriff's vehicles, sanitation, um, any of the other departments. So we actually have a, a process that we call a, a fleet optimization analysis, where we receive from you all a list of all the fleet vehicles that, uh, that we have access to. And then we will we'll build and prioritize a fleet optimization analysis for you to ensure full and frequent coverage. In the event that we are not getting full and frequent coverage within a 90 day period, we will actually come out and install more systems on more vehicles until a, at no additional charge to the county uh, to ensure that full and frequent coverage. Thank you, that sounds great. I really like it. Um, and um, I love the fact that this could really help with grant funding and um, especially the infrastructure funding that's coming down from the feds to the state to us because it, without this type of documentation, we're, we're just we're going to miss out on those dollars, and I'm really concerned about that. So I really like where this is going. Is there any recommendation of how you'd like the staff to move forward? <laughs> I think that was kind of unanimous, yeah, right? Bring, bring it back, back as soon as possible. We, we, yeah, yeah. We have that. We'll, okay. We'll make sure we'll bring it. Do we have enough direction from us? Yeah, you do. Okay. Yep. It's clear. Thank you very much. Sure. Appreciate that. Great presentation, and thank you so much for being online with us today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you all for your time. Uh -huh. Okay, so now we're going to move on to 2.3. This is adopt a resolution accepting the certification of the statement of vote of the March 5th election. And Francisco Diaz, our county clerk recorder and registrar of voters, is going to present. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, so today I'm here to officially bring to you the statement of vote with the election results for the March 5th presidential election. However, I want to take a moment, though, to thank the Board of Supervisors, Ray Espinosa, Henny, and I also want to thank County Maintenance staff for all their unwavering support and all the dedication and hard work they did to get us up and running. The September 6th uh, Hall Records fire could have been a lot worse, but it was mitigated thanks to you, Board of Supervisors, Henny, for getting us the resources for us to be able to move forward. I also want to take a moment to thank my staff, the election staff. Um, in a short period of time, which is only three months, they were able to find a new facility, bring that facility to safety and health standards, uh, rebuild our entire technological infrastructure. That must, it's not only include voting equipment, but also uh, internet connection, telephones, and includes anything that's connectivity to the system. They also drafted an entire new policies and procedures based on uh, legislation and got those approved by the Secretary of State within a short time frame. Thanks to their hard work, we find ourselves here today in that we were able to have a successful election, people were able to cast their vote, and we now I'm gonna be able to present to you the statement of vote. Now, the statement of election results essentially consists of three things. First, it's the official canvas. After any election, we do a forensic audit of all the processes and steps that took place. How many people registered to vote? Who voted? What method did they use to vote? Did they sign their envelopes? How many envelopes? And then we go to the micro level where we look at every single paper that was printed, the quantity, how many were voted. And if we're able to audit the entire process, we move forward to the second step. The second step is essentially the 1% manual uh, count. We uh, take a certain amount of ballots and we manually count them. We do this all in front of the public's view. We also stream this online and we had about 20 people show up this time around where we count those ballots to make sure they coincide with the votes that we receive from the machines. If all that then transfers and it's correct, we can move forward to the official certification. Whereas I, as the election official for the county, take all these information do an additional audit, and then I certify the election, which I did so in March 29. I certify the election, which is that that I bring to you here today. The official statement of election results for the Board of Supervisors to accept and declare the persons with the highest votes for the March 5th presidential election. Okay, thank you. Let's open it up to public comment. <laughs> If you'd like to make a comment in Chambers, please provide a speaker card. And on Zoom, please press star 9 or the raised hand icon. And in Chambers, we have Elia Salinas.
There is no question of the integrity of the elections department and the voter register, Mr. Francisco Diaz. A few years ago, we had a supervisor that voted no to uh, not to certify the election, and that was based on his MAGA beliefs. This year, there is no reason not to certify the election based on any false or fake uh, um, ballots. I do, however, question one candidate for District 5, which is Ignacio Velasquez, who does not live in District 5. It is common knowledge that he does not live there. The Elections Department took his application, and under penalty of perjury, he signed stating that 5850 San Felipe Road was his residence. He changed his driver's license, changed car registrations, and other documents. So they took it at his word. The district attorney stated that it required evidence to go after Ignacio Velasquez for lying that he does not live at 5850 San Felipe Road. Unfortunately, no one has been able to step forward, has the courage, and they have the information, but they don't have the courage because of retaliation. It is without, uh, Mr. Velasquez has no integrity, and Mr. Velasquez does not belong on the seat as a Board of Supervisor. You all have a decision to make. Certify it, it's a done deal. But you also have the right to speak because Mr. Velasquez himself is quoted to say, everybody does it. All of you up there know what's going on, have been watching, have been listening, have been asking questions, have been having meetings. You may certify the election, but at least have the courage to make a statement on your own that the integrity of the elections department is not in question, but the integrity of Ignacio Velasquez is always in question. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any additional? Yes, I have one on Zoom. Celeste Bocanegra, you've been unmuted and you have three minutes. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. I'm not questioning the Elections Department. I'm only questioning um, a certain candidate who obviously we all know is Ignacio Velasquez in regards to his, um, his run um, and how he's bringing the inequity into our community. He, he has opened up uh, just many questions, right? We know that he does not live in this, um, in Board of, Su uh, I'm sorry, Supervisor B. Gonzalez District. We know that he moved. Now, there's so many questions that just arise. I just ask that the Board of Supervisors please ask that question. I understand that it could be hard because you don't want to be put in that situation. But let, for example, Let's just put it into play. Um, I live on the west side, always will, and continue to live here. And if some rich person decides to run my district will and moves into my district, what? I just think that would be unjust. unjust. You know, is it, maybe they do have a right to move into my district, but just not knowing the individuals truly that live in our district, you know, B. Gonzalez has lived there. Um, yes, many do support Ignacio Velasquez because he was the mayor, the prior mayor. So I just ask that you ask the right questions. Um, please consider maybe possibly not approving and until there's a formal investigation. And it's okay. It's okay if you question. 
not bad, you know? So I just wanted to ask uh, that of you, and it's very hard for me to ask that, obviously. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. I have no further public comment. Okay, bringing it back to the board. Questions, comments? Um, Supervisor I, Gonzalez? Yes, I would just like to echo the concerns about the residency issue. Um, I have been made aware of them. I have spoken with the DA's office. I have spoken with the elections office. And I am not in questioning the integrity of you or your office. It is the residency issue of my opponent that I question. And um, I will not be um, voting to certify this for, on that basis. Um, again, what's wrong is wrong, and what's right is right. And this is just wrong. It's just wrong. So that's it. Any additional comments? Seeing none, I'm going to ask, is there a motion? Motion to approve, as recommended. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. So it's a 4-1. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to move on to item number 2.4, which is behavioral health. And, oh, and Dana is here. So uh, approve the advanced step uh, higher for step G. So yes, so thank you um, for hearing this. We are actually very excited that we have a bilingual licensed candidate who would like to join behavioral health. We currently only have one clinical supervisor for the entire mental health side of our, um, of our department. It's currently putting us at risk not to have proper oversight from a licensed perspective. And so this hire is very crucial for our department Neighboring counties are offering $10,000 signing bonuses for clinical supervisors. And across the state, we are at a, um, you know, really a lack of qualified candidates for these types of positions. The candidate has um, solid experience. I do want to emphasize again, she's bilingual. And we think that her joining our department will greatly enhance the ability of our staff to provide the much needed clinical services to our community. There was um, an error, and I apologize, it's a training issue for our staff regarding the AITs, and so this position will be funded out of our Mental Health Services Act, Realignment, and Medi-Cal, so it will not be a general fund position, and again, I apologize, that's a training issue for some of our, our staff um, who are completing the, the board um, item agenda, agenda item documents. Um, are there any questions that I can answer, any concerns that I can address? Before we come to the board, let's open it up for public comment. If you'd like to make a comment in chambers, please provide a speaker card. And on Zoom, please press star 9 or the raised hand icon. <coughs> and in chambers, Elias Salinas. Thank you. We do need, we do need staff, obviously. Um, the only question I have is that um, this individual has only been licensed since eight, in California since August of 2022. She was also licensed in uh, Minneapolis, she, she, uh, from Minnesota from 2020 to 20, 2019 to 2022, and then now in California. I don't know if she was doing teleservice or whether she was actually living in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Um, we need, we do need bilingual. Uh, I have an issue with step G, although I am, I'm saying the complete opposite of what I stand up here for all the time. She has not held a job, a position for more than two years. So how long will she be here? Uh, I understand she also teaches and she does some um, teaching at Gavilan, I believe, some instruction. And is that because she has not been able to get a full-time job somewhere else? We have a, there's, I mean, there's a, a, the list is so open for all these positions that I'm just wondering why this individual has chosen to come and work in San Benito County when there's openings also in Santa Clara County, Monterey County, and Santa Cruz County that pay more. So it's your decision to be made but who did the background on this, on this individual? 
what is the work, who looked at the work history for this individual, and step G, that's the highest step coming in, and is this real individual really uh, deserving of that pay for, for what I've seen in her lack of experience? That's all you need to, I'm asking for you to consider. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any additional? I have no further public comment. Okay, bringing it back to the board, do we have any comments, questions? Supervisor Gonzalez? Yes, um, I've always raised the concern when we start an employee up at the top, the top level in the tier. It just kind of gives them no room for growth in terms of pay other than um, the increases, the annual increases. Um, and I wasn't aware of some of the concerns that um, the public comment just raised. And so, um, do we have any guarantee? I'm reluctant to, to reward someone at the top tier payment-wise and having no employment history beyond two years concerns me. Um, kind of makes me kind of wonder if this person's gonna be looking for more money elsewhere. So um, the individual is uh, relocating to Hollister, so that is one of the, the selling points in terms of um, why this is a good fit for her. And the salary was, was an issue, quite frankly. If, if we brought her in at a lower step, she would be ta taking a significant pay cut. And I, uh, so we're trying to, ad to address that. And um, I can't you know, guarantee the future. I do have hopes that she will stay with us for a long time. Being licensed for two years, while you know, not, not 10 years, um, it is a decent amount of time. Prior to getting licensed, individuals need to uh, be supervised for 3,000 hours of, of clinical services. Uh, they receive supervision and training during, the, during that time. So being that she's been licensed for two years is actually um, a decent amount of time in order to, to provide the clinical oversight that, that we need. I do feel confident um, in, in her skills and abilities. We did work with human resources to do background, um, not background checks, I apologize, but, but reference checks, and they came in solid. Uh, so I really do uh, stand behind this recommendation to the board. I, I fully understand the need for this position. You know, it's, it's been an ongoing issue for years about being understaffed in that area. So while I, I support the move, I don't know if I can support the step G higher. Um, it, it, it does, we are at a very, very competitive time. Again, neighboring counties are offering $10,000 signing bonuses for, uh, for this very similar type of position. I think the fact that we are able to offer uh, a little bit more competitive wage with the recent um, increases that we've had in in our salaries has been very beneficial. We only had one candidate apply. If we do need, if we do, if, if this um, action isn't able to be approved and we do go out for recruitment, I'm not optimistic that we will get um, any, any candidates that have similar qualifications. And I really want to underscore the fact that this is a bilingual candidate. Any other comments, concerns? Okay, is there a motion? So I move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. So 4-1. Thank you so much, Dana, for coming up and speaking today. Um, okay, so we are now going to uh, open this up to public comment for consent, because we're gonna go, uh, not consent, closed session. What about 2.5? Oh, did I miss one? Oh, the new one, yes, sorry, and I even wrote a note. 2.5, and that's going to come back with uh, Steve Loop from our Public Works Department. Thank you for keeping me on the new agenda.
Okay, Madam Chair and uh, Board of Supervisors. So as we discussed briefly at the beginning of the meeting this morning, um, we received confirmation for approximately $200,000 from the state um, just last week, which is great news. But in order to utilize that funding, we actually have to send Sealy Avenue Rehabilitation Project out to bid, ideally tomorrow. And then when that's go out to bid for three weeks, and then we have to award the contract by May 17th in order to qualify to use the funding. So um, we passed out the plans and specifications as the urgent board item that um, you now have in front of you. Uh, I did create an agenda item, but I couldn't put it on the official agenda. So that's the, the first two page um, sheet that perhaps um, the chair can, I guess, read through the, the title and then the recommendations. Yes, um, so let me just read please, through the so. title of it right now. It's adopted the plans and specification for the Sealy Avenue Rehabilitation Project PWB 2360, authorize the chair to sign the invitation for bid and authorize the advancement, um, oh, the advertisement for bid to construct the project. And how is that going to be announced? Is it going to be on your website, social media? Just kind of curious. Yeah, so um, we'll be putting it on the Public Works um, bid page. We also now have an open gov new software that we've just implemented, which is really our main contracting software. So we're actually going to use the new open gov software to um, distribute that out. And there's contractors that check in on that open gov software. And then I believe there's also three trade journals that we advertise on as well. Okay, so we're going to open it up to public comment. If you'd like to make a comment in chambers, please provide a speaker card. And on Zoom, please press star nine or the raised hand icon. And I have no public comment. Okay, bring it back to the board. Supervisor Cosmic. Yes, thank you. This is I knew district, you would want so to talk so. on this. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad to see this. Obviously, um, Aromas has, you know, needed a lot of work for a long time, like everywhere. But uh, quick question, uh, $200,000, how did that happen? Just out of curiosity, I, it doesn't happen every day that we get money from the state for roads. Yeah, so this is a program that um, the state considered. They had some leftover funding from COVID funding, I guess. So this goes back six months. And, and our Caltrans local assistance group um, they are like the middleman between city counties and it's kind of the state folks and even federal folks. And so our local assistance group said, they reached out to the county approximately six months ago, um, maybe a little bit more, and said, hey, there's this COVID funding available. If you have a project you can build, um, you know, you might be able to get, you know, approximately $200,000-ish from these COVID leftover funds. So we applied for it and it went through a process and then we found out last week that um, we are able to use the, the funding. Great, yeah, well, I just wanna say thank you to whoever um, was involved with this. Uh, hopefully we can kind of keep, you know, looking for these opportunities uh, in the future. And I just am very thankful for whoever, um, everybody that was involved, thank you. Any additional comments, Supervisor Gonzalez? Yes, um, while I appreciate finding um, the possibility of additional funds for roads, um, I'm just kind of concerned. This is 115 pages that you just gave to us minutes ago. And so it's not like I can sit here, read it, and I digest it. I mean, I'm a speed reader, but I can't read that fast. Um, and it is 200,000 that we're looking at. Um, and so just out of weariness of lack of transparency, I'm concerned. And I understand time is of the essence. It's an urgency item. I was the one that asked for us to put it on the agenda um, or, or motion to put on the agenda, but I'm just concerned. It's pretty voluminous that we're expected to look at and and we'll be voting for something that is basically sight unseen, um, other than the few words you gave us at the beginning of the meeting. So um, I, I can't support it, sorry, just simply because of lack of lack of information and being able to digest it in such a short period of time. Understood. Um, just a couple things on that note. So um, this project, just to give you a little bit of scope, it's it's pretty straightforward. And in, in as far as a roadway project goes, we're going to be um, scraping off a few inches of 
old asphalt and cracked asphalt and base rock. We're going to be repurposing it, grinding it up, adding some cement, adding kind of asphalt, asphalt emulsifier, putting it back and then putting a couple more inches back on top um, and then working on some of the driveways nearby. So um, that's kind of the scope. So it's, it's not a, a super complicated project. Um, and then also I did work with county council to have her, she helps uh, review the contract documents themselves, the specifications and make sure all our, you know, forms and contract type of documents are in there as well. Um, understood, it's a lot. Um, it is just uh, kind of a timing situation, and so um, that's where we're at today. So. And I won't begrudge you, begrudge you anything by trying to seize an opportunity for funds when they're available. It's just that, um, you know, we have a responsibility to really do our due diligence and receiving at 11.31 a.m. this morning. We're trying to make a decision at 11.36. That's four minutes, and so um, someone's going to cry foul. So I'm just putting that on the record. Thank you. Anyone else? Comments? Supervisor Zitello? Um, I, I just want to thank I mean, I, I think that I, I hear the concerns from Supervisor Gonzalez getting it at the last second isn't ideal. I think this is an exception, and I think that it would be um, not in the community's best interest for us to forgo this uh, money and, and make these repairs and so um, you know I, I know this is I think the first time this has happened since I've been on the board and so I know this is an exception um, I was just curious though um, does the is the full the 204,000 or whatever that we're getting from the state does that cover the entire project no that'll cover about a third so we're gonna the county will have to come up with um, approximately another on the engineer's estimate uh, about 380 so it's roughly a third but I believe that Sealy Avenue was Part one of, of the, the roads community. that we had yeah. designated. Um, this so this is just helping us to get it done at a better price. So I, I'm, I'm all for this, so thank you. Okay, um, my only comment is, again, this is the exception, not, not the norm. Um, but this is a request for invitation to bid. This is not awarding a contract. So, um, I, that's what makes it easier. If it was a contract, I would have a little more of a wanting to understand the bid process, but because this is an invitation to bid, and this is our typical template that we use for roads, and I've seen it before with other projects that you've brought before. So I'm gonna say that I'm supportive so that we don't, because timing is everything, and you don't know during the, the bid process, you know, there may be an addendum that happens because of RFIs that come in and you have to, deal with that and extend the time so um and your window is very short so um i'm gonna uh, be supporting this so is there a motion motion to authorize chair to sign the invitation for bids and a second second okay all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. opposed nay okay so that's do we need to do i know there was three specific things so there was adopt the plans and specifications for the sealy Ave rehabilitation project then authorizing the chair to sign the invitation bids and then authorizing the advertisement for bids to construct the project. Did that one motion include all of those or do we need to do each one separate? As yeah. Okay, perfect. As so uh, we did the four one for the signing. So now let's go on to number two and you can combine it with number three if you'd like. So number two is authorize the chair to sign the invitation to bid and authorize the adv uh, the advertisement of the bid. Yeah, okay. Motion to move forward is recommended. There you go. All right. Is there a second? My motion. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Nay. Okay, four, one, and that's for all three items. Thank you for the clarification on the bid. Yep. Yep. No, that's good. And since in, in good on time right now let's let's go back to the four consent pulled items and so we have 1.6 which I believe Steve are you back on again yeah yes, yes and I pulled those and so yeah let's start with 1.6 in that supervisor uh, Gonzalez um, this alludes back to a conversation that we had um, an, an issue that I raised at a previous board meeting in terms of contract awards how they're being awarded, who makes that decision, and um, and is there a panel? Are you the only one? I mean, are you taking direction from someone else? Um, what's the process? Because um, this is not the first time that we have raised the question about 
contract awards. And so um, as the public comment mentioned, this is um, amendment number four, um, not to exceed 301,442. And I'm questioning the award of contracts, the process, who's involved, um, when is it conducted, who's giving input before all these final awards are being presented to the board um, for approval? Great question. So, um, yeah, and I, I tried to put in the background summary that back in 2021, we issued an RFQ per the state standard process, and we said um, we are looking for civil engineering design consultant teams to be on call, hoping that we would get funding in the future and we need consultants to design road projects and bridge projects. So back in 2021, um, we had 16 folks that actually proposed and the county, they have a panel. I wasn't actually a part of the panel, but there was a panel, I believe it was three folks, where you rate each proposals from each consultant and then um, the top five that were rated became our on-call consultants, and Kinley Horn's one of them. And so just to kind of give folks a little bit of perspective, over the next three years, I think I'm rounding, we're, we have about 40 to $45 million just in road projects over the next few years that are gonna be constructed. We also have, because of Union Bridge, which is a $40 million project, we also have $70 million of bridge projects that are gonna be built over the next few years, um, maybe you know, plus or minus a few years, bridges take a while, but, um, so you have 70 million in bridges, I'll say just 40 million, roads. no, it's closer to 50 million, so I'll say 50 million roads, 70 million bridges, $120 million of projects. So generally speaking, consultants are about 10% of the cost of a project. So if you have $120 million of projects, you know that's $12 million just in consultant fees. And so that's just to get the projects out to bid. For example, the one we had to rush today, we had a consultant help us put together the plans and help with all the specs and, you know, so, in order to build 120 million, we're gonna be spending roughly roughly $12 million from on-call consultants. So, um, and some of these consultants, he went back to a previous RFQ for some of the bridge projects, but the point being, um, even for this specific project, you know, so Kim Lee Horn, they did a great job. They finished phase one, which assessed car, the car bridge, car avenue bridge, and it said, okay, here's the water flow going through, here's a scour that's gonna happen on the bridge, you know, here's some in preliminary environmental studies. And they did that first phase. And so now they're saying, okay, we wanna go in the final design documents, which is I think about $300,000 we're asking for for this amendment. But Kinley Horn has an umbrella contract. They were one of the five that were originally chosen. They're doing three bridge projects. I think they're doing four road projects. So there's gonna be amendments to their contract because what happens is, depending on the consultant, some of them got a half a million dollars umbrella contract early on. I believe Kimley Horn got a million dollars. I might be wrong about that, but it was either a million or half a million. And so they're gonna, if, if we're doing our job at Public Works, they're gonna exceed that amount. They're gonna need amendments because to spend that $12 million and you know, our five consultants, I think it was, let's just call it $5 million originally. If we're doing our job, they're gonna need about $7 million more in amendments just to build the projects that we all want to build in order to build $120 million worth of bridges and roads. So um, I'll pause there, see if that oh, okay. kind of answers the question. Oh, well. but no, you go ahead, Ray, because yours is more of a technical question. Mine's just kind of trying to understand. I, and I was just, if I may, um, Madam Chair, of course, um, just one other point of clarity, too, uh, with bridges. Um, the going out to RFP, RFQ, very important we deal closely with Caltrans and from a budgeting perspective and a managing that it is extremely important that we keep those contracts those amendments those changes within the time frame if the time frame elapse if the contract elapse and we go oh we got to go back to that what what ultimately happens if they're doing some work or uh, we could lose that money from Caltrans because we actually didn't keep that amendment up to date. So that's like super important to keep. Um, so there's a lot of handshaking with Caltrans, especially on the bridges. And um, we got to keep that those 
those contracts, um, those people that are actually working on it are familiar with it. They've already been we're doing all this work. They may continue to conti you know, do work. They have to be, we have to amend that, that contract. So it's super important because we could lose the funding. I just want to make that, make that pretty clear, pretty important. We almost, and just <laughs> when we had uh, a change in leadership, um, some of these, um, some of those bridge amendments um, weren't followed up. We had to go to Caltrans, and we had to make a special request not to lose the funding. Which is when big. you say we had a change, is that when we lost our RMA staff? That when we, we had, had RMA okay. turnover. So it's really important to keep these active. Okay. Well, as I said, I pulled this one just in deference to the public comment, um, but I have a global question just regarding the contract award process, period. And I'll talk more about that at the, at the public hearing that we have later. Um, so you said this was one of five, um, the Kimberly Horn is one of five that we have in terms of um, consultants. Consultants, uh -huh. yes. Okay, and then you said 16, you had 16 RFQs when this initially went out? That's correct. Okay, so we did do our due diligence then way back then. Okay, and this is not an issue of where it's a bait and switch, it's a necessity in terms of for the project to go. And I see Shirley Murphy, um, County Council, is, is agreeing to that. So okay, good, I just wanted to make sure. Okay, thank you. Then I will withdraw my my um, motion, uh, my opposition to this, and I'll go ahead and move to approve for staff recommendation item 1.6. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that's 5-0. So we're gonna move on to 1.7, also Supervisor Gonzalez yes. and Steve, stay right where you are. O <laughs> also to the same questions that the public comment raised, um, this is does this person live outside of the area and what are the logistics in terms of them providing services for us um, and it can the CSA offset some of the cost and would San Diego staff um, county staff be able to to operate a second vehicle and what is the cost of a second um, street sweeper vehicle um, and and are uh, the questions raised even valid so I think that the questions raised are valid because the city of Hollister was able to procure their own street sweeping vehicle. They might have two. Um, I don't know if they got that via grant or how they acquired the street sweeper, which is a pretty significant investment, just FYI. Right. And then once they acquired it, um, they do have at least one staff person that I know of that that's primarily their job is to just sweep the streets kind of around the clock. So it's valid. Um, we can look into how much they cost and how much the city pays. We did that with the custodians, and it's actually turned out really well. The board said, right. you know, we'd like to, to bring the custodian work in-house. We looked at it. We moved forward. And I think most department heads are, are pretty happy with the custodial service compared to having it outsourced. So I'll look into it. it again, it's a significant investment for the street sweeper, but maybe we can get a grant or I don't know. Um, well, I'll, we'll look into it, and, and we'll get back to you as uh, kind of a, a board-requested item. So I'll write that down. Okay, thank you. Sure. Then I'll go ahead and move to pr approve this per staff recommendation. Oh, his location, sorry. Um, where okay. does he live, and will he be operating his equipment here locally, or will he be bringing it back and forth? Well, yeah, let me, I had the my internet glitch a little bit. Um, we did go for an RFQ, and I don't know where all the folks, the companies are based, um, but we essentially went out to a, a, you know, a neutral RFQ process, and Jack Davenport was selected as, as one of the folks that um, were selected just per the RFQ process. So let's see if, if I can find where he's located for you. Um, looks like they're out of Bakersfield. So. But again, we just went through the process. We put out to bid to the public for any company service folks that wanted to bid on it. And they were the ones that were selected to um, utilize their services. So. so in that RFQ, is there any provisions of his um, equipment being here in the county for when they're available and needed, because it looks like we're going to be um, there. He's going to be servicing a couple CSAs, um, namely, what do we have? Ridgemark, Long Acres, um, Santa Ana, Lemon Acres, um, Quail Hollow, Oak Creek, 
Um, and so where would the equipment be housed? So um, I don't know about where the equipment's housed, but I do know they all provided pricing and we reviewed their pricing to make sure it wasn't, that it, that it was reasonable. Um, I don't know where they're gonna house the equipment. I'm just concerned about the vehicle breaking down going to and from Bakersfield. Um, and then the CSAs, um, is the cost gonna be deferred to the CSAs then? Yes, it will. Okay, so that's a yes on that one, all right. Okay, um, I will go ahead and then um, move to approve, provided you're gonna go ahead and bring us back the cost or possibly the county um, looking into a, a vehicle to, to do our own so we're not having to contract out, okay? So move to approve for staff recommendation item 1.7. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that's a five. Up. <coughs> Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Okay, thank we're you. moving on to 1.8, and that was pulled by Supervisor Kosmicki. Yeah, thank you. And, oh, um, Steve, you're still here. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, okay, Steve's handling the CFD part two. Um, oh, it is Steve. Okay, because of Linda. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, so we've had an array of these CFD annexations, it seems like, more than usual lately. I'm just wondering if there's any rhyme or reason for that. Is it just incidental? Is there something going on here um, in the bigger picture? Bigger picture. Um, the majority, almost all, of the recent uh, CFD annexations, not all of them, but most of them are just uh, minor subdivisions. So property owners are deciding instead of one big lot, they want to have um, four smaller lots. And once they do that, it triggers, it triggers um, them having to be part of the annex into our community facilities district. So at a minimum, they have to pay for uh, law enforcement and fire suppression, firefighting services, and then some admin overhead costs for the county. Um, so it's basically just folks subdividing. Again, I only know of any, well, none of them have recently been a project that's gone through the process. The, even the major subdivisions like Vista del Crabia or Fairview Corners got approved before any of this board was on the Board of Supervisors. So they're just going through that process. So um, it's pretty much been just folks wanting to subdivide their property that triggers the Okay, and just to get a better, I think, you know, I'd like to get a better understanding of CFDs now that we're getting a lot more of these. Um, but my understanding is, so this, correct me if I'm wrong, so they pay this fee when there's, essentially there would have to be a house built, a residence built, so um, it's a one-time fee? So, um, annual, is it one time? No, it's, it's actually an annual, so okay. what That's it, what I originally thought, and then I, I'm looking at it in the staff report, and it just says, it doesn't say annualized, so that's why I want to... Okay. Uh, make it, sure it, that it, will follow up to that. Yeah. So to answer your question, um, and I'll go back in the staff report maybe after, but um, yeah. So it's definitely an annual fee, and so the way it works, there's two ways someone can implement or use a community facilities district. So the bare minimum is the one I mentioned, where it's average is at about nine hundred eighty dollars a year for sheriff, fire, and county admin overhead. So that's a bare minimum. That's an annual assessment. Then what happens is if folks want to build streets and roads, some of them don't, some of them are just subdivising, but let's just say hypothetically, they have lots and some new streets and some landscaping and lighting. They have the option to have the CFD, the county also maintain those services. And um, that, is calculated per project on a per project basis. So, for example, when uh, Fairview Corners, they, even though they were approved years ago, they're starting to go through the annexation process now, they said, we don't want the county to do any of those interior specialized services. We're gonna have our HOA perform those services. So they're gonna work with their realty folks and they come up with internal costs and their HOA is going to maintain the streets and landscaping and parks. Some other folks um, actually want the county to maintain those services and so we do a calculation for them 
We say, okay, in addition to the $900 for sheriff and law enforcement, or for firefighting, um, there's gonna be another $700 a month assessed to each property owner, and then the county is responsible for either doing landscaping or maintenance or maintenance of the parks. It just depends on what that developer wants to do. But they're basically annual assessments. Some people, I think, are broken into every six months, they have an assessment, but the number is per year um, that's put on their lot, I'll say. Is that okay, kind of yeah, I get that, yeah. Okay. So how does inflation play into this? Because this is 2018, this was established, the whole formula and system, and I think you know where I'm getting at here. How does inflation, if at all, play into this? And my understanding, I've heard in the past that that's, that's maybe a flaw in the system here. I, 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 res I totally support the CFD in principle, and I'm, you know, I want to. I'm going to support these. I, I would assume, unless we come up to some, you know, issue here in the questions. But um, what, what can we ex explain the inflation part? A, and then uh, go ahead first on that, and I have a follow up to that. Yeah. So um, great point, and I think that's something that the county um, needs to do better because we're allowed to increase their assessments by um, consumer price index. Okay. And I don't know if it's every year or every few years, I honestly don't know, but I know we haven't done that much in the past and we, that's one of the things we're trying to look at currently. We're actually doing a whole assessment report of all the CSAs to see how much they bring in, do they pay enough to cover their costs, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know if yeah, sure because there's been quite a bit of inflation since 2018. And I'm wondering what when the last reassessment was, but go ahead. Yeah, I think mean, Shirley is going to be able to help elaborate a little further on this. Sure. Yes. Um, uh, so, Linda, or er, sorry, Linda, <laughs> Linda Young could probably could drill down on the details better than I can because she's the one who works directly with the uh, consultant, SEI consultants. But every time we have one of these come forward, they go back to the original fee assessment report and they go to the analysis and then they update it to current levels um, so there is an adjustment that happens um, in the rate before it comes forward and I believe every year when they do their budget I think they're even the ones that were previously approved I think they update um, the amounts per year so it's based on the CPI though you're saying and I believe there was a CPI um, built into the fee report. It's been a long time since I've looked at the specifics in the fee report, but I know that when they do their annual budget preparation, they look at those numbers and they're adjusted annually. Madam, Madam Chair, if I may, uh, board, I, I think this is something we could come back to your board on and get be more um, direct. And and um, my I, I know that th there was some we had incorporated some in language in there. I know we're also working with um, our company uh, that deals with impact fees, fees, CFD as well. So um, I think just for clarity purposes, I don't, I don't want to assume something. I think it'd be good to come back with a report on that. And that's, an, yeah, I appreciate that because I think just to have, I think we should have those answers before. I'm ready to put the brakes on these at this point because we've had so many of them come forward and I'm wondering why and I, um, you know, I, I think we need more clarity on whether we are charging the appropriate fees based on inflation or not, because there, there doesn't seem to be 100% clarity on that. And, it, and at some point, it would be advisable, and I believe it is staff's intent at some point to go go out and do a new report to kind of read. You should be doing it like every year or two, I would assume, especially because of what we just saw this last year or two with inflation and how enormous it was and you know if we're not charging appropriate fees that's going to hurt us you know that's going to really hurt us if we're not we're not getting as much money as we probably should be is kind of what i'm seeing here can i chime in yes of course okay um so uh, just because i think a future agenda item would be a great idea one explaining the difference between a csa and a cfd csas have to go through the prop 218 process cfds do not that's why we like them so much because but if we're not inflating those prices with the current cost it, it it is a loss for us so i i agree with that but understanding that that uh these annexations are not approving any development. They're only bringing in revenue right. for those parcels. And so I'm I'm all about yeah, taking the, money. One of them has 140 The subdivisions were already approved with 
conditions that they have to fulfill before they can get their final and or parcel map to record. Gotcha. And one of the conditions of approval is to annex into the CFD. So they're basically, you know, working through their list of to-do list of things they need to do in order to be able to come forward with the final map or a parcel map that can then be recorded. Madam Chair, may I? Yes, go right ahead. Um, but the one on, so 1.8 is a project that was, looks like was approved in 2020 and we're talking about 149 single family homes. So we're approving basically the fee now that they would be paying. It's not just a parcel that's being subdivided. This is the fees that they would be paying per unit. Right. And, our, and our, if we approve this, are we foregoing out opportunities for revenue if we're not putting these fees at the appropriate level, at least until we re-up at some point? When can we go back to, let's say, to this developer and say this uh, 1800 per unit fee is going to be increased now because we did a re-examination? Well, no. um, it happens during the annual budget process, but at this point, it would be, I believe, next year before there would be another adjustment. Madam Chief, if I may, I, I just wanted to verify it and, and just double check. So I actually went to our website and pulled up the CFD report. It's 2324 report. And in it, it's actually, um, it, when you look at uh, tax zone as an example, there's a tax zone for a Brigantino piece on the CFD with, within that, that area. There, that does show that there's a summary of special tax rates by year in, the, in this particular um, tax zone. So in the establishment of that um, from 2018, there was an actual annual annualized rate. 2019, it went up based on the Bay Area CPI, which is 4.015%. Then the following year in 2021, it went up 1.1. So it was again based on the, the CPI. 21-22 went up 3.8%. 22-23, 4.99%. And 23, 24, 4.19. So it has shown an escalator, okay. Okay. and we have been recouping that. I, I, that. I yeah. was pretty sure about it, but I didn't want to commit to that <laughs> until I looked it up. So, yeah. Okay, that answers that. I appreciate that. Um, and then the Vista del Calabria approved in 2020. I just want to make sure, and that's why I'd asked RL, to, sorry for pulling you back from lunch there. Um, just wondering, just want to make sure for the public's sake, this was approved before any of us were on the board. That um, is correct. And they have entitlement, full entitlement. There's nothing, or um, where are we at on the for entitlement? They have entitlement uh, for the duration of their tentative map. So if they don't complete uh, their conditions of approval and get final map before that expiration, then they will lose entitlement. So but what discretion do we as a board have? Or, or do we not have any discretion at this um, point on the 149 homes that were? Um, at this point, um, that discretion uh, has occurred. Uh, the only thing would be the final map that would come to you. Um, and basically, it's yes, you've met the conditions of what was approved. Right. Okay. Just want to make sure, especially for the public's sake. Um, and then, so I'm okay on, on uh, that you answer my questions on 1.8. So that's all I have for 1.8. Um, and I'll move to approve as recommended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's 5 0. Okay, so now on to 1.9, and that is going to continue with um, RMA and Supervisor. Yeah, Sesame. I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, so, obviously, Ray and Peggy Pierce, real estate folks, um, not beating around the bush here. So, uh, uh, are they subdividing this at some point? Is there discussions about subdividing these properties, these parcels for um, future residential development? You mean further subdivision, I guess? Well, these are, what I read is that these are, th go back to that specific one. I don't want to get the two of them mixed up. Um, they're subdividing into uh, one parcel of 19.5 into 5.4, 5.4, and 8.5. And there's no residences and no development is proposed at this time in the staff report. I just want to make sure, is there, um, is there talk, are they going to bring forward uh, because I have a follow-up that's that would if you'll, before answer, Ariel answers that question when I want to um, further answer some of the, the rewind on the, the fees going up those are just kind of CSA fees in the past that we're trying to play catch up with but the CFDs I think we answered the question yeah the the yeah and I understand how CFD differentiates from CSA okay Ariel to better um, planning is not received uh, a further application um, I, I think a lot of these are just kind of people's 
um, estate planning, okay. and uh, they're not you know proposing residences at at that time. Uh, so does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I understand. I'm not, this is not a gotcha here or anything. I'm just I'm just curious what we're what we're go the road that we're going down here to get a picture, and then so the the that there, this one for this tax zone was nine hundred dollars, and I understand the other one obviously like we just talked about was eighteen hundred, and they're developing, and I'm sure they have more specific plans on what they need and services and all that, and that's I'm guessing why the dollar more. But but can you just clarify why this is like half as much? for this one per unit compared um, with the other one? Yes, uh, Steve can come up and answer further, but it, it depends on what uh, services are included within that CFD. So, and right. Yeah, really good question. Um, so just the the basic, basic um, annexation requirement for fire for and sheriff, fire and admin, right. that's about 900 and change, usually 970, 988. They, like I said, they do a calculation for the area and they come up with that. And then for this specific subdivision, they also, instead of having their HOA, maintain streets and parks and things. Um, they send us all the costs of those improvements and then our consultant calculates how much annually it costs to maintain and or rebuild those after 20 years. Um, and so that's why it's double, essentially, because they're asking for streets and sidewalks, and they have right, a, right. kind of a legal I, I assume that's what it was. But so you're, you're correct. My follow-up is, so what if they theoretically come forward, and that's why I'm bringing this all together here. What if they theoretically come forward and propose whatever, 150 or 200 or whatever, single-family residences? What What's the process that happens going forward? Does that $980 fee get recalculated appropriately? It's going to be a brand new application. Um, this uh, zoning designation, I believe, is um, AP, which is five acre minimums, which means they would ha they would have to go through um, the entire planning process um, to do something further. So it would be recalculated. That's yes. all. Uh, yes, it would. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'll move to approve as recommended if there's nothing else. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 So that's five. Oh, any opposed? Sorry. So that's a five. Oh. So that will conclude consent. And now we're going to open up public comment for closed session. If you'd like to make a comment in chambers, please provide a speaker card. And on Zoom, please press star nine or the stand icon. And I have no public comment. Okay, so no public comment for closed session. We're going to go into closed session. We will be back at 1.30 for the public hearing. Is um, that the correct time? Before we go into closed session, can I ask a question on 4.2? I had asked David to provide more information because there wasn't, it looked like it was just a um, repetition of 4.3, and he wasn't able to provide any information. So is there anything that you can add publicly to that? Yes. 4.2? Um, no, I, um, I was still off sick when the agenda was prepared, but I, um, contact staff and ask what it what I I don't know nobody knew what it was I think we can remove it from the agenda oh for 4.2 yes okay um it can I get a motion to a motion remove? to remove that per staff recommendation 4.2 can I get a second second all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed okay so 4.2 so we only have 4.1 and 4.3 thank you for that clarification and we'll be back at 1.30, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay, making sure. I thought they were annual fees, and I'm, I'm just looking at it right now, I'm like, I don't see that.
John. Okay, we're coming back from closed session to clarify clarify the closed session agenda. Um, we had originally removed 4.2, which is actually being added back. Um, it is an insurance claim, and it's been brought to our attention that we do need to address it today. So we're adding 4.2 back. Can I get a motion to add it back? Motion to put it back on the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So now we're going into closed session. We'll see you at 1.30.
Okay, and so we're gonna go to County Council. Do you have anything to report out from closed session? Mike. Three items in closed session. The first one was um, a discussion of a pending claim. Um, the board voted to reject that unanimously. Um, second item, uh, uh, there was direction to staff regarding an unanticipated litigation. And the third item was pending litigation, Bravo versus um, County, and uh, direction was given to staff. Okay, great. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our um, public hearing. It is 1.32, we're gonna open the public hearing. And we're going to turn it over to Mr. Loop from Public Works. Okay, good afternoon, supervisors. I'm just going to um, read the title of this agenda item. Um, the Board of Supervisors is to hear the bid appeal by Felice Consulting Services regarding the rankings determined in response to the request for qualifi qualifications, RFQ, Construction Management Services for San Benito County Free Library Expansion, County Project Number PWB 2314, and the negotiation of, agree of an agreement with Veneer Construction Management. And before we go further, I think because I had a conversation with the applicant, I have to disclose that I had a conversation. Yes, you should disclose. Okay, so I'm going to say that I had a conversation with Mr. Felice. As did I. As did I. As did I. I heard the concerns. Same. Okay, we've all disclosed, and we're going to move on to... I'm looking at what's next. I'm well, I was looking at this. Um, county council. I think is it open to the so public or public? Yeah, please, David. Um, I apologize. The way this should proceed is, Mr. Felice is the um, appellant. Um, he should put on his evidence. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. You're here to judge the fact, the credibility of the witnesses. Um, once that is done. Um, if there's any op opposition by the other um, uh, bidding party, they can put on their evidence and Mr. Police can do a rebuttal at the end of that. Then the, the hearing would be closed and you would go into deliberation. And, and we would open it up to public comment after we hear, before we after go into deliberation? After everything yeah. Okay, just making sure I got that right. Okay, so Mr. Felice, if you'd like to come up. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna go through and read a uh, statement that I have here. Um, uh, my name is Damon Felice and I'm the president owner of Felice Consulting Services, a local program, project, and construction management firm currently in our 15th year uh, in business. As you know, I'm here because I have appealed the results of the RFQ for the construction management services related to the renovation of the existing library. Just to give a little history on the process, the RFQ was released by the county on November 22nd, 2023, and we submitted our package on the due date of December 28th, 2023. To my knowledge, only two firms submitted RFQ packages for the project. On January 25th, 2024, I was informed by, the county, by county staff that Felice Consulting was not selected for the project and that the county would be contracting with Veneer Construction Management for the work. As a, re as a result of that selection, I followed the county's purchasing and contracting policy manual and filed an appeal with the CAO's office on February 2nd, 2024. I re received a response from the county on March 1st, 2024, stating that in their opinion, there was no findings in my appeal, but I could file another appeal to appear before the board, hence I'm here today, um, I filed the appeal on March the 12th and subsequently filed a document called the San Benito County Appeal Form Bid Protest on March 18th, 2024, um, and that's the document that's um, in your package. Um, in the document, I stated reasons for my appeal. At this time, I would like to go over those. My first reason, 
Uh, county administration did not follow their own purchasing and contracting policy manual regarding local preference. The manual states that local preferences for supplies, equipment, or services may be considered when, when, all, fa when all other factors are determined to be equal. Uh, preference shall, shall be considered for firms having a bona fide place of business within the County of San Benito. Just so you're clear, Veneer is in Sacramento. Um, we, are, we were established and located here in San Benito County. In addition to that, on the scoring evaluation sheets, which the county used to score the firms, it states that they were to use a local preference as part of their scoring and or selection. Yet nowhere on that score sheet was a local preference considered. I have attended a number of board meetings over the year over the years and including today and I hear the public and supervisors asking staff about hiring or using or purchasing from local companies yet in this process that was not used I understand public contract code has limitations on when public entities can and cannot use local preferences but for these services uh, there are no limitations FCS is not only a local business, but we are also invested in our community, our community. FCS is part of the Business Council, Chamber of Commerce, Community Foundation, as well as a number of other nonprofits in the community. My second reason, on the evaluation sheet I just mentioned, it also states for projects other than architectural and engineering services, as determined in section 10.1, cost is one of the criteria, or may be the sole criterion. This process was was called an RFQ or request for qualifications but as part of the process the proposals that we had to um, issue what the county called a GMAX a guaranteed maximum price for the work that is a proposal therefore therefore should be considered when making a selection yet slimmer, similar to the local preference previously mentioned nowhere on that score sheet was that taken into account Cost was part of the RFQ, and it should have, been con should have been considered as part of the selection process. My third reason. Within the RFQ package, it states the contractor selection committee may interview the top three contractors on the shortlist. As I mentioned, there was only two who submitted. The county, does, if the county does not desire the contractor to prepare a formal presentation. Um, it is our intent to discuss the project with the contractors, lead project personnel in an interview format. If an interview process occurs, the final ranking of the contractors will be based on the results of the interview. However, the county may bypass the interview and begin negotiation with a single selected contractor, which in the opinion of the selection committee is clearly, and I want to emphasize clearly, the best qualified. Only two firms submitted proposals yet they did not go through an interview process. The scoring was very close between Veneer and FCS, and I questioned how Veneer was clearly the best qualified. In my over 20 years of submitting RFQs packages and acting as an owner rep in issuing RFQ packages, um, either when I was shortlisted or I have helped the owner shortlist, there has never, not ever been a time where we did not do an interview. An interview is a standard practice unless there is only one firm that responds, and even then, interviews still take place. One example as to why I think an interview would have been appropriate here, um, Veneer was given a score of 18 out of 20 on project understanding. As you may or may not know, my firm worked with the Friends of the Library, which included county staff, county member, or community members, and community members on a programming document which set the framework for the current layout that is being completed as part of the bridging documents for the project. Additionally, I've been attending the Friends of the Library meetings for years. With, yet with all of that, we were given a 16 out of 20. I understand that the person who gave those scores is from Southern California, and I'm sure he has no idea what the Friends of the Library is and who we are or how involved we have been over the years. This, among other items, is the reason public entities interview for these types of services. And my final reason I filed the appeal is because I feel there was favoritism given to Veneer in this selection process. The fact that no local preferences, no interviews, and the proposal amounts were not taken into account are all clear signs. Additionally, over the past seven years, Veneer has been given over $7 million of CM work 
by the county. I use the word given because not one time was there a vetted process for the nine contracts that they were that were awarded to Venier. No RFQ, no RFP, nothing. To date, I have not been given Venier's GMAX, um, Guaranteed Maximum Price for the CM services associated with the library expansion project. And there's a legal reason why. I've requested it. It's not that they're withholding anything. There's a legal reason why I can't, I can't have that information. So I understand that. What I do have is a copy of their original proposal for CM services for the library expansion project dated January 12th, 2023, which the administration was planning to bring to the board for approval until someone brought it to the county's ad county administration's attention that they should be issuing an RFQ or RFP for these services. Their original proposal amount was just over $2 million. Some of the scope that they, they included in that proposal was removed as part of the RFQ that the county issued. But even with the removal of that work, their number would have been plus or minus $1.4 million. Again, I did not know what the GMAX number is, so I did not know if they submitted, what they submitted was less than or more than that number. I put a few scenarios together using Veneer's original proposal. Let's assume that Veneer's GMAX was the same as their original, as the original amount of 1.4 million. That amount would be over 50, would be 50%, over 50% higher than the number I submitted. Um, I have a spreadsheet with a number of, of other scenarios um, um, with different numbers. If I had a three point, if I had a three point average difference in our scoring, um, but a 30 or 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50% different in our, but in our, in our proposed number. I question why administration is still moving forward with this. How much could our library get out of that money um, of the re with the renovation work? Based off the number I previously mentioned, again, let's assume that their number was the same as mine, which would, have, would, which would be best for the county and the library. Should the administration be asking, why is it so much lower? If they did lower their number um, to what my proposed amount is, that means they lowered their number by over 50%. That raises the question, were they, were they overcharging the county by that much over the past seven years on all the other work that they were given? Am I not, I'm not accusing anyone of doing that, but doing that, but based off of the numbers, that would have almost been a $3.7 million overage. So that begs the question, why wasn't the county using RFQs for all those projects? Why was the county only giving work to one CM firm for all those projects? And now, even when the county goes through a vetted process, they are still awarding that work, even though they are potentially hired. This currently frustrates me as a local construction management business owner who submitted on the project, but it also frustrates me as someone who lives and pays taxes in this county and drives on the roads in these counties. How much could $3.7 million potentially have gone into roads in the county? Um, in my opinion, all these items show favoritism to, uh, to an out-of-town, much more expensive firm. For the above reasons, I request that the county reconsider the award of the CM services to Vineyard. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have representation from Vineyard? Okay, so come on up. And please state your name. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Murphy. I'm the Central California Area Manager for Banner Construction Management and tickled to death to be here today. Unfortunately, under these circumstances, but uh, I am here um, uh, to um, respond to the uh, protest that has gone before you today. Um, I guess the easiest way for me to approach it, I know I sent an email earlier. Thank we you all very, got it. So thank, thank you very, very much. much. Um, so really, I'm going to be following along a lot uh, along those lines. Um, Can I ask the clerk of the board? Do we have this available at the back? Okay, if there's copies at the back for everybody, if you'd like a copy. So just a little, just a very little bit of information about Banner. Uh, Banner Construction Management is a um, minority woman-owned firm. We uh, are celebrating our 60th year anniversary uh, this year. Uh, our 
headquarters office is out of Sacramento. Uh, I currently uh, oversee the two offices, one in Fresno, California, and the other in San Luis Obispo. Um, our work uh, for this project comes out of the Fresno area, and uh, we do have uh, local people as well uh, that, that work on these projects. Um, so there's several things that Mr. Felice brought up today um, that uh, first off um, I will say that it is this um, protest has been costing the county um, time and money uh, to go through this process. So um, it's unfortunate. Um, we try to save counties money, but in this process, because it's taking time, it is, it's called escalation, and it's still going on. And so I'm here to show or to, to uh, express to you uh, what we have uh, identified within the protest and, and kind of go from there. So um, Mr. Fleece, uh, he first brought up um, item number one regarding the um, local uh, preference. Um, the reference uh, here uh, applies to the Purchasing and Contracting pol uh, Policy Manual Section 2.1.B um, and professional services contracts to engage independent contractors to perform professional services through contracts for the county and offices thereof with or without furnishing material where the aggregate cost does not exceed $50,000. We are well beyond $50,000 on this project. Therefore, this item really is, um, does not apply uh, to this at all. Um, I don't know any more to say to that. If you look through the RFQ, there is nothing that talks or speaks about it. So it was never brought up. It's not a part of the point system. It wasn't brought up. Um, so therefore, it uh, doesn't apply uh, to this instance. Uh, secondly, um, per uh, uh, Felice, uh, Mr. Felice, um, cost was not considered to be a, a part of the selection process. Um, the county did not take into account the cost of it. And our response is um, the cost of service, the county reserves the right to negotiate the proposed cost with the respondent prior to contracting, uh, contract assigning. Agreed to costs are to be firm guaranteed maximum price through the end of the contract term. The county reserves the right to negotiate per the RFQ. It's very simple, it's, it's plain, simple language. Um, that the county gets to make that choice. And the county chose um, to make that choice and said that we would prefer to negotiate afterwards. So there is nothing in the RFQ that states that there had to be costs associated with it. So again, um, this item is, is um, shouldn't even be brought up because it wasn't part of the RFQ. Um, I apologize, I'm a little nervous today, okay, standing in front of you, I'll be fine. honest with you. You're doing fine. Uh, <laughs> item number three, um, Mr. Felice uh, mentioned the contractor selection committee may interview the top three contractors on the short list. I've been in construction project management um, for 26 years now. Um, sometimes we have presentations and interviews, other times we don't. It's not all the time, it's probably not even 50% that we have to do presentations or interviews. Um, if we are the most qualified or someone else is the most qualified, a lot of the times the staff will identify that and say, we select this team. Um, other times it is very close and it's very tight and so they want to see, okay, who are the staff? Who's going to be working on our projects? And then uh, we are asked to, to provide a presentation. That it, so it's. It's very standard uh, to not have a presentation or to have a presentation. In this particular case, um, it was up to the county to make that decision and they chose not to uh, have those. So therefore, it, 
it's it was the county's choice to to make that it was not uh, the bidder's choice whether we get to uh, present or not um, and obviously it was clear that um, that the best qualified firm was Vanner in this particular instance and that's the way the county saw it uh, the county had the right to bypass the interviews and so that's what the county chose to do um, it's interesting that um, Mr. Felice had, did have the opportunity to work with the library folks and, and integral part of San Benito County. Uh, we have been very fortunate to work on uh, several projects together on behalf of San Benito County, um, but we did not put this package together. We didn't know anything about it. Um, we really didn't know about anything about Mr. Felice until this issue came up. Um, we were just doing our work, doing our job. So when someone that was basically inside that knew all about this information, um, we can't help that. We, we didn't know that they had this. Um, I don't appreciate people thinking that they know what our costs are. Um, we run a legitimate business like everybody else. Um, we are throughout the California um, working with clients, counties, and cities because we do a good job and because we are fair in our pricing. Um, so to throw out numbers arbitrarily to, to say what we've done, I just, I don't, I don't appreciate that. Um, so uh, finally, we are a professional service, um, which means with an architectural firm or a construction management firm, uh, you don't necessarily have to go out to an RFQ and RFP if you decide not to. That is your choice. Um, so to say that um, we had received uh, work just because we're, we're here and we've turned in a proposal, that, that's just incorrect. So um, I hope you see that we were the best value. Um, we did show and prove to the county that we can do this work, we have done this work, um, and that every single item that Mr. Felice has brought up, um, it, there, there's just no factual backing to it. There's nothing here um, that, that shows that we did anything wrong or that the county did anything wrong. I think everyone did everything right. I think he's just bummed that he didn't get the work and now he's gonna try to fight to get it. But I, I attest that we won the work fairly and we ask that you continue to keep it on this and we look forward to continuing work with the county and, and continuing on. So with that, that's Thank all you I. so much for your comments. Thank you. So I open it up to rebuttal now. For so now we're gonna bring Mr. Felice back up and you, is there a time limit on this? I don't think there is. Rebuttal is limited to um, rebutting what was said only what was said okay no, not we do in his case so. well I'm an engineer not a attorney so I you know I just received this document uh, three minutes ago so for me to rebut is a little that's tough for me to do but I will say this I didn't pull those uh, those numbers are not arbitrary I'll give you guys have the document because I've sent it to you D dated on January 12 2023 two million dollars and if you reduce the scope it's 1.4. I didn't make those numbers up. It's on veneer letterhead. It's their documents. So I didn't. I didn't make that up. So again, if their number was 1.4 and you go through a vetted process and it's lower, well, why? Why is it lower? Because you went through a vetted process, but they, but they, they have fair numbers and they throw this out. I see they've they've saved the county five million dollars. I mean, come on. What, what, I, I mean, that's just that's absurd to make a comment like that. But I did not throw those, those numbers are actual numbers. I went through Novus and I saw every single, con the nine contracts that they've been given have, have been that. I'll give you an example of, of one that the board approved in June of 2022 for the migrant house, the migrant camp for $93,120 for Veneer to do. You, they never did the work, we did the work. My firm did the work as part of the CPM uh, contract that we have. We charged $23,000 for that work. But I mean, I'm sure that they have saved the, the county $5 million for all the fair, fair stuff that they've done. 
So those are not, these are actual numbers. These are not arbitrary numbers that I'm throwing out there. These are actual numbers that we in this room, not they, because they're in the valley, but we in this room, it's our tax dollars that are being paid. In excess of what? Because county staff wants to give this work nine contracts to someone? Those are all real numbers. Seven, uh, seven years, nine contracts, over $7 million. I'm not making, those are not arbitrary numbers. Those are real numbers. You look on Novus. It's not that hard to find. Anyone in this room can do a search and find that information. It's not that hard. So, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Would you like to come back up and rebut? Is, is that correct? We both get to go both ways, don't we? I want to make it sure I'm doing this It would be sir rebuttal, right. but he, um, it goes on and on if you don't limit it. It's limited to what he just said. What he just you. said, yeah. And we, we do it one time. Yep. And we could agree that he did not rebut what I said. He just brought up the numbers again, uh, arbitrary numbers, throwing it out. Um, so all, I'll, all I'm going to say is, number one, again, um, escalation is real. Uh, time and money is real. Um, this three months of waiting through the, this protest, uh, we're actually, the county is actually losing money on the project. Either they're going to have to add money to the project or you reduce scope, one of the two but escalation is real. We care for the county's money, and therefore we want to see this just go through. Um, uh, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of false talk just now um, about our company, about funding and, and money. So um, I guess that's, I'll leave it at that. But thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Okay, we're gonna open it up to public comment. If you'd like to make a comment in chambers, please provide a speaker card. And on Zoom, please press star nine or the raised hand icon. And in chambers, I have Tammy Aviles. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Board. My name is Tammy Aviles with the Friends of the San Benito County Free Library and also um, previous co-chair of the Coalition for a New Community Library and Resource Center, which now has folded into the Library Expansion Committee under the Friends of the Library. Got all that. <laughs> um, so I am here um, to, I guess, just speak about it from the Coalition I guess, point of view. Um, our coalition started in 2017, and Susan and I have been working on it um, ever since, advocating for a new or expanded library. Um, Mr. Felice has attended and you know been part of our membership. Um, in, on page 10 of the RFQ, um, where it talks, about, um, sorry, um, I guess referring to page 10 in that first paragraph, um, in 2022, the coalition, or the Friends of the Library received a grant from the Monterey Peninsula Foundation, which we were able to use for an architect to provide the renderings, um, and which the current architect doing the bridging documents has used those renderings um, to kind of jumpstart their, their version of the floor plan for the new library. Um, so, you know, we've been involved um, since the, you know, well not since the beginning, but we've been involved since 2017. Um, and with Mr. Felice's um, assistance or guidance um, you know with the renderings and um, moving forward and community outreach and engagement um, you know it is an example of his expertise and efficiency and then if you refer to page 16 of the RFQ it talks about the um, FF and E and the furniture and equipment is actually excluded from the $10 million grant. And as you know, 
the friends have taken on the challenge of raising money to outfit the interior of the library. Um, and so I think whoever is awarded this contract, though, will be working with them. Um, so we're, you know, obviously looking for a partner. Oh, okay. Thank you for your comments. Next in chambers, Elia Salinas. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Well, golly gee, a $30 billion corporation wants to help out little old San Benito County. That's great. But shame on San Benito County, and right now I'm going to point the finger, I'm sorry, Ray, CAO Ray Espinoza. How does this happen? How do you do a contract and you negotiate later? This is exactly what I've been complaining about, is you do a contract and then you come back and it's $5, and this one is saying that the co that's going to be negotiated later. If I understood it correctly, there's more negotiations after you do the contract. How do you know what it's going to cost? Based on what they say or based on what your experts say? So they come in and they say, well, we're going to do this really great job for you. We have all this experience. We're minority owned. That's great. But what happens to San Benito County? We are on the losing end every single time we deal with these contractors. You did it this morning. And this morning, the example was used that it was because of bridges. We weren't talking about bridges in the contract that I was talking about earlier. So the word may, it's a legal term. That's what, they, that's what they're defining right now. They're using the word may because it is a legal term instead of shall. You as a county, you're the boss, you tell the CAO what to do. And in my opinion, this needs to start over again with regards to how it's done, who's interviewing, who makes the choices, and good grief. They didn't have to do RFPs or IFQs. They just gave it to them. It's, the, it's on the, 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 the pleasure of the CAO, or is it on the pleasure of a department head? I don't know, because that wasn't said. All I know is that we have a local contractor, and we should have emphasis on trying to keep our money local. This corporation's coming in from out of town. I don't know if they're booking their hotels because they have employees or they do some contractors or whatever it is. We're losing money. More than anything, this is embarrassing because it is on Novus. And if you all haven't done your homework on what exactly Mr. Felice is talking about, you need to go do it. You need to make a decision that you either put this in a stay right now and you do something about it or you clean it up from the bottom, but I think you need to consider giving these, this award or this contract to Mr. Felice because he seems to be up here with the most sincere words. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next in chamber, Susan Logue. Hi, hi board, nice to see you again. Uh, Susan Logue, Friends of the Library. Um, Mr. Felice has been attending our library expansion meetings really from the very beginning, and um, I don't think we'd be right now where we are with the library expansion if it hadn't been for our um, Monterey Peninsula Foundation grant that we were lucky enough to get. And because that was uh, provided the renderings for the library's expansion um, at a very minimal cost, we were able to stay under the um, amount that we needed for the Monterey Peninsula Foundation. I feel like Mr. Felice really helped in that regard and really um, saw that we were trying our best to do the most we could for the little bit of money that we did have. But as a result, those renderings are now being used and I feel like it kind of helped really kickstart the whole process for the library expansion. So it just seems to me that if um, we have a person who's in our community who's so invested and has really shown already um, 
a real frugalness that we might want to continue to check this person out and give him a full interview or whatever the process might be next. But I, it seems that because he's done so well with our community in the library and the library expansion, we'd like to really support his endeavors. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. I have no other public comment. Okay, we're going to bring it back to the oh. Yeah, back to the board. Bring it back to the board for deliberation. Can I just have a, a comment, if I may? Sure, CAO Espinoza. So I, I just want to bring in a level of context. First of all, administration um, was not involved with this process. It, it was with RMA. They went through the process. I um, just want to make that very clear. Um, we weren't aware or not involved with the rating, uh, the meetings, the events that actually transpired or occurred. And this is hopefully the discussion about administration is probably RMA the administration, but not the CAO administration. So I just want to have a point of clarity with regards to that. Regards to some of the sole source um, actions and Ray um, being discussed here, um, the negotiated element of it is it was it within the RFP. Uh, that was, you know, um, something that was part of it. Again, I was not the one that submitted that or requested that so um, but it's something that we can look at I think I think we do probably need to look at re, you know some of this process um, obviously is lesson learned here one other I think key point with regards to the sole source piece is I, I don't approve I don't approve the, the budgets I don't approve excuse me I don't approve the projects to get approved um, especially these types of projects which are pretty significant um, the boards do in, in years past and the board was very clear I think the majority of that um, six million and change um, was regarding roads and just like you're here up today we're talking about roads like we need to get that software as soon as possible the board when this first started we got measure G they were like we got to get the roads fixed do whatever it takes sole source it, whatever. So we had direction to to move as soon as we can. The board members were involved with the process and um, they're the ones that actually approve that. I just want to be very clear because there's some context there that I want to share um, that I think is important. Um, and, and I'll leave it as that. So, yeah. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. Okay, we're going to bring it back to the board. Is there somebody that would like to make a comment? Supervisor Gonzalez? Yes, I'm looking at the page two of the three page um, letter from Veneer and where it has item number three per um, the FCS. This is um, item one, point one, lowercase i. The contractor uh, selection committee may interview the top three contractors on the shortlist. However, the county may bypass the interview and begin negotiations with a single selected contractor. In my humble opinion, I feel that therein lies the issue, the May aspect. Um, we as a county, I have been raising the concern for the last three years about not having an established local preference for um, local contractors, and not just with this specific issue, but across the board. I mean, there's contractors here locally that would like to work for the county, but for some reason they are excluded. And that's what I would like to see the county do something more officially to set up a criteria where we look at local contractors. Um, they live here, they work here, um, we should have some sort of preference and um, I don't see anything in that respect. Um, going back to some of the other concerns that were raised, um, Veneer, you mentioned something about the, es the escalation is real and the escalation um, cost. Can you explain that for me please? Because from my understanding, the state gave the county a little bit of wiggle room to ex to extend the contract. So where I'm concerned, I don't see any lost money, maybe time, but not lost money. And I've been um, associated with the Friends of the Library since about 2017 as well. And so I've seen this process go through. I've been waiting for this process to happen. And um, I don't want to delay it any more than we have to. But what's, what's right is right and what's fair is fair. And I'm just going to fall on that sword. So explain to me what the escalation is and what the cost is costing us and what does that look like in your opinion? Absolutely. 
Uh, escalation is continual. It is nonstop. Uh, it is, if you look on the California Construction Index, there is uh, escalation markers, which show you month to month uh, how much it is going to cost for uh, a square foot now versus what it's going to cost in a month or what it's going to cost in two months. So the and cost so increase is what you're referring to. Okay. Exactly. So every month, if we're, if we're stagnant, the cost is still going up. And so that, that's what I mean. We're, we're sitting here for three months having this um, time that it's stalled, and we're not out to bid. We're not, we're not receiving those bids yet. The price is still going up. That's what I mean by escalation. Right, and we've seen the cost escalation rise significantly since COVID, just exactly. since COVID alone. Um, and, I, and I hate to use that as an excuse, but that's what everything's attributed to, inflation, the cost of inflation, everything. Um, okay, and then can you explain a little bit more of what um, Mr. Felice mentioned about the migrant camp um, issue out there where you guys got the funds, but they did the work? I didn't understand. You'll have to ask him on that. I, I'm unfamiliar with that. Uh, particular project. Okay. Madam Chair, may I call um, Damon back up then to ask that question? Absolutely. So what's the question? So regarding the, the micro camp, you had mentioned something about... So them in June of 2022, um, the county approved a contract, the board approved a contract for $93,120 for them to do the CM services for the work that was performed at the migrant camp. Um, they ended up not performing that work and we did as part of our C CPM um, uh, contract that we have with the county. And it was they were their number was 93, we charged 24. So that's those are those are not made up numbers, those are real numbers. I know that uh, those are not arbitrary numbers. Okay. So and I, I as far as the escalation are the bridging documents ready? I mean, I think maybe Steve can talk about that. It, are those 30% documents even ready? Could you be on the street looking for a design build entity without those bridging documents? I mean, they may be done now, but I, I'm not sure how long they've been done. So to say we've lost all this time without the bridging documents, you cannot get a number. You can't get a G GMP from a design build entity without those bridging documents. So, I mean, you may want to ask Steve about that. I'm gonna um, sound ignorant here, but I don't know construction language whatsoever. Okay, so bridging documents and GMP, what are those? Guaranteed maximum price okay. is, is what the GMP is, and bridging documents are basically what these are the documents that are gonna that are that, that put together the criteria, the kind of the criteria documents for what the ultimate design and the build out of that library is gonna be. So those documents are needed and, and need to be part of your RFP. That is that is put out for design build services. And, and who would provide that to us from the county then? Um, Pardon me. The bridging documents. Who would provide That's that to the, us? Uh, ABA is doing those bridging documents right now. That's the architectural firm. Yes. Okay. Both Supervisor Kosmicki and I were on the facilities committee last year, and this has been a conversation that we've been having for a long time. Tune but ongoing. Those as well. yeah. Yes, the ongoing process of the expansion for the library. Um, I'm glad to see it moving forward. I'm sorry that there's you know this delay but um, I'm more caught up on the fairness aspect and the, the lack of any kind of local preference in our policy, written in our policy, or any kind of weight put on it um, when we look at contracts and they're submitted to us for approval. So thus extended my comment. My, my Can I make one comment? When I, in r to raise point, I, when I say administration, you're right, I mean management. I didn't mean your office, I meant, not no. Not raise I mean, I mean administration <laughs> as in management. So I, I <laughs> want to be clear to, with that point. I use the generic term good. admin. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank right. you. Thanks, Sam. P please, if there's something you can clarify for me. No, I just, just wanted to make one point. I have no idea what he was talking about—a ninety-three thousand dollar contract. That's fine. I don't. I don't know. I'd be more than happy to look into it. But I don't know what his scope of work was. I don't know what our scope of work was. It can be completely night and day. So unless we really looked into what the scope of work is and what the qualifications are, you, again, you're just, they're throwing C out. Comparing numbers, apples so. and oranges in your aspect. Okay. Correct. Okay, noted. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Kosmicki. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple questions <coughs> um, for staff. Um, some things have been raised here. Some, some questions have been raised. I just want to clarify a possible um, is there any sort of um, validity to any sort of conflict of interest 
uh, issues now that with uh, Felice working with the library folks leading up to this, um, having access to inside information. Um, I know nobody wants to speak right now, but if somebody <laughs> somebody could answer that. I don't. I don't know. Legal should. Yeah, I, I, I legal should. Know. I don't know. Um, I know that issue was raised. Um, I I haven't seen facts that establish that, and Mr. Police was allowed to bid. Yeah. Um, so he was a considered a qualified bidder. Yeah. During the process. So I mean, my biggest th thing. I mean, I think there are some lessons that we certainly need to learn from this, this process going forward and maybe looking at policies and cleaning some things up. Um, I just want to get the library built. Um, I want to have a construction manager who's qualified and can oversee it and get it done in a timely manner, uh, have the project look the way it's supposed to look. I'm a proponent, I believe the majority of us are, are proponents of having the, the biggest facility we can get out of the dollars we have as opposed to a fancy artistic looking um, piece of architecture um, <laughs> and um, that's just how where I'm at I'm, I'm more concerned about space than, than anything here I just want to have somebody who's qualified that can oversee this and get the biggest bang for the buck um, I think that's all I have to say thank you thank you supervisor Kuzmicki. supervisor Zanger yeah I just had a question um, I don't understand the the Five million. Can you explain the five million savings? The how the veneer saved five million for the county over seven years. I don't quite get that one. Absolutely. Um, we've been fortunate enough to work for the county of San Benito for many years now, and over the length of that time, we have through the change order process, through our marketing efforts, through our bidding efforts, um, we can quantify that. Um, but that's where that number comes from, from all the changes that have taken place, our negotiations on behalf of the San Benito County um, to reduce those costs that are coming in. Um, ultimately, over all that time, we have saved uh, around $5 million. Okay, thank you, yeah. Um, and then I guess I, I will, because I, I thought I understood it, and now after everyone's speaking, I feel like I'm missing something. Maybe Steve would answer this. Um, but can you explain the, the numbers, I mean, I guess they're, I don't really understand the negotiation aspect, the numbers, they gave numbers, but then those numbers are fluid. I don't really understand how that, how that part of this works. Yeah, so regarding the, um, the cost proposals from the two firms, so originally with the proposal they submitted their prices for the work and that's what I believe I emailed to you last night and it showed that delta amount right um, and so that's what they're talking about but not just this contract but consultants when when a consultant you know wins the project or, or is ranked highest I just I should say is ranked highest um, then you meet with the, the consultants and you know, sometimes you, you say, okay, your price proposal covers all the items that we thought and we're good and you just move on and with that original cost proposal, like the ones I sent you last night. Um, other times, they'll, the county could say, well, you know, if the contractor is doing this or, for example, the architect that we have now is doing maybe a little bit more than we thought they were going to do on purpose, they did a special assessment. So we say, okay, construction management person. There's slightly less scope that you have to do now, and so therefore we would like, you know, a new price, and that's the negotiation part. But when I sent you last night, those were the original two proposals. Those were apples, apples, with the, the number that you saw last night. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, I believe it does. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I had another question for you, Steve, when you're there, though. Um, so, so the and I and we kind of talked about this a little bit how the process works with the the points and who's most qualified. What was the the point difference out of what did each firm come out with out of the I think whatever it was 180 or whatever it was. Yeah, overall there was just a three point difference. Both proposals demonstrated that both firms are very qualified and would do a very good job. For what was the total out of the points? Three total each. So in other words, out of a hundred point scale. Hundred. Yeah, hundred point scale. Um, I think. One firm averaged 91, and the other one, the other one averaged 98. I'm, I'm rounding, but um, okay, and then very the, close. And the cost difference originally, 130 thousand dollars. 
Out of how many? How much? Well, one was at about 830 and okay. the lower one was at 700. So. Okay. Um, you can go ahead. And thank you. Supervisor Satello. So I just want to start off by saying that while I declared that I had talked to Mr. Felice, um, I had talked to him a couple months ago. He called me being frustrated but didn't go into all of the details that were here. So it's not like I've had a conversation with anybody regarding the specifics. So I'm going off of what I have as paperwork and all of the you know kind of background materials. Um, for me, what we've kind of pointed out is that our, to me the process is really flawed. Um, I do see in our purchasing contract that we do have that local preference where it's listed um, under local preference. I didn't see the $50,000 limit. Um, maybe it's buried in there somewhere a little bit deeper, but I don't, I don't understand why we would have the $50,000 limit. Like if it's under 50,000, we give local preference, but if it's <coughs> over 50,000, we don't consider local preference. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, so right there, I, you know, I, I think the process is for me a little weird. Um, and to not consider the cost is, is a little bit odd to me in my non-construction <coughs> knowledge, right? Um, to me, Vanner was not clearly the most qualified based on everything that I've seen uh, to have three points difference. And I think it's really subjective, all of those questions, right? I mean, there's, um, so for me, it wasn't clear. I would have liked to have seen us go through an interview process. Um, I, I feel like some of the um, examples that were given um, maybe we're not comparing apples to apples but it seemed like it was the same project whether we're talking about the migrant camp for 93,000 and somebody else can comp complete it for 23,000 I mean it seems like I, I don't know there seems to be some big differences when we make the claim that five million dollars has been saved to the county <coughs> How can we really know that if we haven't been going out for a bid and getting anything to compare it to? It seems like we keep people competitive when we go through this RFP, RFQ process. So, um, and I would say that we may have gone that route in the past. I would say this Board of Supervisors collectively, we are wholeheartedly believe in the RFP, RFQ process and that's kind of our thing kind of moving forward. Um, I think that I would suggest at this time that in, in my opinion, um, that we open this back up um, for the RFP, RFQ process. Maybe costs are gonna escalate, um, but clearly between the two right now, there was a $130,000 difference. So I, I don't know, I guess I would really rather get to kind of the, the heart of it. Um, I gotta be honest with you, in the letter that came from Vanner, I felt it was a little bit threatening with the, um, what was the words that were used? Um, if the Board of Supervisors amends the outcome of Vanner's selection, Vanner reserves the right to use all legal men means to rectify the situation. Honestly, we have to do what is right for this community. And so I'm sorry if it doesn't feel fair, but I'm sitting up here thinking about my constituents and about th what's best for this community. And while $130,000 isn't a lot in kind of, you know, to some communities, it's huge here. And so um, I, I just, I, I guess I would, um, I would feel most comfortable taking it back out. Um, but I really would like to see us look at our process. And um, if we have to make a decision today, I'm prepared to make a decision. But um, because I don't want to extend this out too long. Um, so if I had to make a decision today, I would go with the local. But if there was a way, but I, I would really like to see us um, possibly look into kind of some of the claims regarding sole sourcing and, and what is our policy around that, right? And how can we, how can we correct that so that we always do what is right for this community and we stay competitive, we get those competitive bids because if we don't have anything to compare it to, we don't, we think it's the best, but is that the best that somebody can do? I don't know. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Supervisor Zanger. Yeah, I just had just a thought off of that and, and kind of finishing my thought here, I, I realized I didn't, and wasn't clear um and I understand about going back out I don't personally even know if that's necessary at this point I'm just thinking local or not local three and a half percent difference in points and a 15 percent difference in cost 
if they're both qualified, I would just naturally assume you'd go with the, the cheaper option if there's such a small difference in, in quality and they're both deemed to be capable. And I just think it'd be, be great going forward if we had that in writing somewhere. We come up with whatever numbers, whatever ratio we want to have. But if they're both qualified and if there's a very small difference in points and one is, you know, it's a rather significant percentage of, of cost difference, I don't know why we wouldn't go that route. And that's just, those are just my thoughts just finishing up there. Supervisor Kosmicki, did I see that you wanted to make a comment? Oh, sorry, I saw a raised eyebrow like, just wanted to make sure I didn't ignore you. No, I agree with uh, what Supervisor Zanger just said. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, and I just, uh, for a point of clarity, but I think it's something that we probably should look at when we bring back our purchasing policy because um, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, in section code, just, just so the board's aware and the public's aware, uh, 2.10 under local business preference, it does highlight um, that we do provide uh, local businesses um, a, a, a um, you know, advantage, uh, a 10% advantage, but it's for materials and supplies. It's specific to um, uh, materials, supplies, uh, fixed assets, not services or so this is something we probably need to do some more homework on and bring back to your board because this doesn't really apply to the, to the local preference. But whatever the board decides to move forward with, just wanted to make sure as a point of clarity that we do probably, if this is what the board wants, we can bring it back at a later date. Thank you for the clarification. Madam, Madam Chair. Supervisor um, Gonzalez. To respond to um, your um, comment on CAO, I think that's why the local preference needs, needs to be included because these are residents of our community, born and raised, most, most of them, you know, um, open up a business here hoping to do business with the county, and a county contract can be very lucrative. Um, it can make or break a local small business who's trying to, to, you know, establish themselves. And if we're in a position to be able to work with our own community members, I think there has to be a, a marked um, um, little push in the scaling process. Um, and and I, would, I would urge us to make sure that we amend our policy and procedure to reflect that um, because this is not the first time that local preferences has been an issue or locals feel that they are excluded from the process because of the way the decision making process has been made um, and I'm not crying foul to anybody at anyone but it just seems like the process isn't fair and it hasn't been and I've been complaining about just even the way we we award contracts in general who's making the decision how are we how are we weighing those and, and who ultimately makes that decision that you bring to the board, UST or, or any other department head, brings to the board for us to approve. And so I just question the process in general. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. And just to follow, I just want to make it clear for myself, I don't want to speak for everyone else, but local preference does, it's not part of my decision today. It's not part of, I agree with Supervisor Zanger that when we're comparing costs and qualifications that if it's close enough on the qualifications that cost should play an overriding factor. I don't think we can use local preference. I don't I think that's a future issue to deal with. And I certainly don't want it to become a legal issue because we're here talking about local preference as much as we are. But I um, to me this is a this is a qualification issue and it's and that's really it's close enough on qualifications. The cost um, is much lower for Mr. Felice and um, so that's where I'm at. Thank you. Okay, so with all those comments, unless there's more, I'm going to make some comments. Um, coming from a construction background of 11 years as a project engineer, I dislike bidding public projects because of all of the wording in the RFQ process of what you have to do. With that said, I did read, of course, the entire RFQ, and I did go through and found several items that bring pause to me because it there's a lot of county choice in that RFQ which to me is very it, it gives a lot more weight to what the county wants to do as opposed to what's the most qualified bid and what's the best bang for the buck with that said um, I'm not going to bring up local contractors because I think that is a future item that we need to address um, a, as a board but um, Looking at a selection between these two right now, I think 
in my opinion, is just asking for litigation. I think there's enough issues between the ranking, the wording of the RFQ, and um, the price that I would recommend going back out to bid and um, having the wording of the RFQ updated so that it is more clear on what the ranking is. Now, whether you, I know we have an ordinance thing, so we can't do anything on the local, so I'm going to stay off of that. But also, in, in looking at where projects can save money, you know, value engineering is just a part of the construction process. That's when you go through a project and you look at where can we save money, and that normally happens after you've awarded to a general contractor, unless it's part of your bidding process that you have the wording in there. Um, so I don't know if that's something that we might want to add is if, if there are ideas for value engineering in the future that could save cost uh, for the county. Um, I am very concerned about the, the purchasing policy and ordinance that we are in the process of reviewing and the new software for contract management, but also is for the RFQ, RFP process and documenting. I think we've kind of been, and I, I'm going to say I've leaned very much with Supervisor Kosmicki did we get three quotes did we get you know bids you know did we go out for an rfq and i haven't been super happy with some of the answers that we've been getting back so in my opinion we really need to review our process but i think it needs to be reviewed independently because i'm not liking what i've seen in the past and so i don't know if that's something that we can ask council uh, or outside count I, I don't know but i think that we need to review our actual RFQ, RFP purchasing process so that we don't have these kind of things happen in the future. I think we kind of set ourselves up in, to be in a bad situation right now, especially by not including costs in the evaluation. I just, as a public entity, I just don't, qualifications are extremely important, but when qual quali qualifications are as good as the two that bid, then we really need to get down to the meat of it, and that's price. Um, so. Uh, I agree with Supervisor uh, Sotelo that I would recommend because of this situation that we go back out to bid, um, but I would also like to recommend an, uh, an external review of our process so that we can get this fixed in our new purchasing policy and ordinance before that comes back to us. That's my take. Madam Supervisor? Chair. Yeah, well, one question is how long, how long would this potentially take? The second one, the second point I have is that, um, so we go out for an RQ. Um, they already submitted. They already submitted their, you know. So what are we doing here? I, you know. So what are they going to resubmit the same amount? So are they going to? I don't know how that works, honestly. And if we, can I, and, and also just lastly, um, from a legal standpoint, if we were to theoretically overturn the, you know, the, the initial preference from RMA, are we putting ourselves in any sort of a, um, you know, having any liability legally? No. Well, awarding a contract is within your sole discretion as a board. Could action be taken against us? No. It, it, it's within the board's discretion to issue contracts. It's solely yours. And um, why the um, RMA can go through the process um, and uh, prepare bidding and, and the, the, the contract is ultimately awarded by the board um, based upon recommendations of staff. You don't have to take the recommendations. So there, there is no legal exposure for you in exercising your discretion. You're immune from. Because I'm, I'm ultimately concerned with the amount of time that this could potentially take if we restart this process. That's a very serious concern. And, and I could totally be on board to making a selection at this meeting um, if, if it's true that, I mean, because I also read the letter, and, you know, in that line about, you know, rights, legal means, that, that doesn't sound like we're not going to have another protest here or some sort of litigation of some kind. Um, but if we are covered and we can make the decision, what I don't like is that um, I, the way the wording of the RFQ was, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't adhere to, you know, what we're selecting. I mean, it didn't include cost, and I think that's a huge factor, especially for our residents. But I agree, the time is of the essence on this. So, with that said, I still would like to recommend a review process of of this whole process. Yeah. 
So if, if the board chooses to move forward with a selection, I would still highly recommend that we have an independent review of our RFQ, RFP bidding process so may that we can get that included. May I make a motion then? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I was just <laughs> going to say, so you can just give us direction on who you want to go. We still got to come back to the board with the contract and the whole thing. So that's still going to come back before you, you know, at a later date. So that, the key here is just give us direction on on which way to go. Yeah, the only thing before you make your motion, the only thing, and in, in, in this may, and please tell me if I'm off topic and can't discuss this, but what a new uh, option for bidding could be when we have a hall of records that had a fire and is completely gutted and mobilization is not included in the grant funding for this. So every time we move somebody in or out of a facility, it's on the county's dime. And I really think that we should be looking at the hall of records as an option um, for the first floor for the library expansion. It, it's just, that's my opinion. And I know I wasn't on the ad hoc. Yeah, it's a little off agenda. Oh, did it? <laughs> it did come up. Okay, well, thank you for having it, it come up. It did come up. We discussed it With thoroughly. Facilities. Uh, okay. I agree, that that, but that we were told that that was not, essentially not an option at the time. Is that still not uh, But an I believe option? that was before the before fire. Before the fire, it was. Oh, yeah, see, before the fire, I agree. That's right. way too many mobilizations, and but I, they're all moved out now. <laughs> walking the line on the <laughs> so I, I, might, I might be walking the line here, but that's another consideration that the preference. board. I wanted to overhaul the whole old, old courthouse and make it a library. That was. I don't know if I'd say the whole courthouse, but I would definitely like to look at what that first floor, especially if you expand it out to the columns, what that could look like footprint-wise for the library. So with that said, I know I stirred the pot a little bit more, but that gave us a different way of looking at a new RFP, RFQ. Well, it gives us information to take forward on the facilities um, committee as well. Yeah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. So my motion would be then is, um, Ignoring the the local preference for hiring, but but adhering and embracing the the, the um, concerns and comments that uh, that um, Supervisor Zanger made in terms of cost and the the min the minuscule little differential in terms of the the two different bids, I would say that we um, uh, reject the current decision and reverse the decision and go with the other party. Do we come? Oh, I'm sorry. We have to you go right ahead. I need a second before you start talking, though. You can talk after you. Second. Okay, I'll, I'll second, and then I have a question. But do we? You said we come back and do that. We're basically just giving direction to come back to discuss it again. Is that the idea? Uh, no, it won't no, we'd be, be making discuss. a decision we, we on this one, but we'd go further with whatever else that has been suggested to move forward on today. Yeah. So the the the, the next phase of this is we got to bring back a contract based off of the results of the RF. P. So that's what we need to finish up. We need to come back to you. Come back with a contract approval. Yeah, the vote, the, the, the discussion today is basically addressing the rating, Banner versus Damon, and the discrepancy in that. And, and, and um, Damon Felice had concerns with, with the numbers that the county came up with. Um, so with that being said, um, your board is is going to agree with Damon or not and give us direction of who, who to come back with with the contract and stay with Banner or go with, with, or with Damon Felice. So that's what we need direction from you today. And we will come back at a later date with the contract. Okay, so I've got a first and a second. So the first did not include, it was selection. It did not include any review. Okay. Okay, so uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's a 5-0. So I'd like to make a motion that we do an external review process um, of our RFQ process. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so I think we have made direction. Thank you. And we're gonna move on to item number 5.1. Is that where we're at? That is correct. We have one item, you guys, come on. Yes, that's And I'm correct. really sorry my computer died, so I, I just need to log right in. This is just one quick little thing and I'm sorry I didn't keep my computer active here. Um, okay, so future agenda items. One, um, I did put in for a future agenda item and this, I, I just kind of want to explain a little background. I was asked to, to give support uh, for a future funding from uh, the state of California 
for a future uh, second high school. Um, when I got the request, I felt that just me as an individual supervisor, it would not have the weight it would if it was the entire board, and I wanted to give the board the opportunity um, to have a conversation about this. So this does not uh, approve any selection of where the location of the, the second library would be, or the second, sorry, library's on the mind, the second high school would be. This is not about any of that part of the process. This is strictly, and after going to that realignment training, um, understanding that education is really a state requirement and safety is really our core county requirement for the Constitution. I learned a lot at that training. I do have to admit that was a great training. Um, recommend it for everybody. Um, I would like to recommend a letter of support for the high school to get the state to take some of the burden off of our local residents um, because I do know any second high school is going to require more funding and I, I want to reduce that as much as possible from our local residents. So I would like to have a letter um, of support for state funding be presented to the board as a future agenda item. Is anybody I'll, I'll interested? Second, I'll second that. Okay. Mm, All okay. in favor? Can we have a discussion okay. then? Um, you can discuss, yes, please. Okay, so just um, just with the provisional that this letter of support is not a letter of support that, that the county is weighing in on the funding aspect. Totally agree. And, and that needs to be clear um, because, as you said, you know, the education is the state's um, um, responsibility and um, the community right now is divided on a second high school. But if you have children at the high school, you know firsthand the need for a second high school. How it's going to be funded is a whole different conversation that um, that I don't even want to get into today. But there is definitely the need for safety um, in terms of the, the students that are currently enrolled and that will be enrolling in the next couple of years. Um, and so, yes, I will s um, continue that second and, and do a, a support letter for the second high school, but that's with the funding from the state. Is there any other comments? Yeah, Supervisor Yeah, Kassinski? I just want to clarify. Um, so do we have any idea like what level of funding might be available I believe they're asking for something like 42 million or uh, it might be a little higher than that is what they're asking for for funding um, there's uh, multiple electeds I guess yeah. that have I been just reached okay. out to and yeah. I just I just like it coming from the state way better than coming from our residents yeah I mean I, I you know there are 36 3700 students obviously they're gonna need a second high school my you know if and when I get involved in this debate, I you know I'm just not clear on what type of high school we're looking at. You know, yeah, I have I, I, very I'm specific. Um, you know, whether we're t you know like a new Christopher High School type of thing or something that more on the end of what I would personally prefer as a resident of this community. Um, that's more academic focused and maybe not a traditional high school. But so this would not include anything yep. of that magnitude. I just want to make it clear that I'm not necessarily supportive of. A specific direction that the high school district may or may not go on. I, I completely and I agree and I don't know I don't feel that this letter in any way would say we are supporting going a certain way what I wanted is to show because of the concern that we don't have money to contribute to the high school I know that so this is one way of showing but they are gonna ask for a lot they're probably gonna ask for a big but deal. I, I I'm gonna tell you right now I have a really hard time with any of that ask especially with our other very important urgent items so, so I'll just I just want to make that clear and that I you know if that discussion happens I, I think there needs to be a lot more on the table than what I've currently heard in public including uh, I don't mean to cross lines here but including unification of school district districts and other things that would save taxpayers a lot of money just okay. want to put that out there okay if I put my name on this thing okay no problem okay all in favor unless there's another comment so this is to bring it back with a draft letter for you to give comment and approval is that good can I, can I, I, I got an, I got nods. Is that good enough? Because it's a future agenda item. Everybody nodded. If you count them and nobody objects. Okay, how about anybody object? Okay, good. <laughs> I'm going to say 5-0 for being able yes. to bring this back as a draft. Okay, thank you so much, you guys. And with that, can I get a motion, motion to, to adjourn? adjourn? I'll second. A, and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody.